members in the room include, along with myself, is Robin Newton, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Andy Allen and uh, Alex Eason. And on Starleaf at present, we did have Fra. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. We have Fra McCann. I can hear you, Fra. You're there. You're very welcome. So Fra's come in on Starleaf. Um, members, we'll just get started then straight away, and we'll go to agenda item number one, which is a ministerial briefing on the Housing Executive Investment Challenge. Members, a, previ um, a previous ministerial paper on this issue is at page 21, and can I just remind members that the minister is only available until 9.30, but officials will stay on if there are any queries after that. So can I, without further ado, then welcome the minister to our meeting. Good morning. Morning. How are you all doing? We're all doing very well. Thank you, Minister. Um, are we? Do you want to say any opening words, or do you want to go straight into questioning? Go no, straight straight into question. Um, could I just clarify something, yeah. Paula? So the, uh, this is around the housing statement. that just wanted me to present on. Okay. Yes, it is absolutely. It's to do with housing. Okay. So um, what what I've been able to do is to extend the 10 to 20 to 10. Okay. So oh, I'll, go okay. straight in, I'll go straight into questions for you because you've all had the statement. There's no point in reading it all out. You've all got it. So and it's just to give the members uh, of the committee um, more options around some of the questions they may have. That's brilliant, Minister. Okay Grant, thank you very much. Um, members, I am going to go straight to members for questions. I am quite fortunate that I torture Carl with questions, so I do. So I am going to go straight out to the floor and open it up first. So the first person to uh, notify me the one to speak is Alex. Yeah. Hi, Minister. Thank you. Um, Minister, you mentioned in the Assembly um, you did your statement about um, the housing executive and the building of new homes and letting them do that and stuff which was really great and really positive. Um, now, I've sort of had a wee bit of time to think about it, and it's still great and positive, but where I have concerns uh, with that is your announcement, how long will that take to come through to uh, fruition, where we actually do see new houses being built by the housing executive? That's the first one. The second quick question is, in my experience, we never can hold a housing executive to account when it comes to housing issues. And I refer to the quality of cavity wall insulation and the amount of houses within the housing executive sector that are full of damp. And no matter what you do, no matter how many times we debate this in the assembly, nobody seems to hold that a housing executive to account and force them to fix their own properties properly. Um, you have cases of the housing executive actually being taken to court by tenants because of, of high, uh, ca lack of cavity wall insulation or the lack of quality of cavity wall insulation. If, if we go ahead and give them the power to borrow money and build new houses, how are we going to make sure that we can actually hold them to account? Because from my experience, they just don't, aren't, with, well, especially yeah. with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, so how long will it take? So as I set, set out in the statement, I'm looking to the end of this mandate to get um, get actually a whole timeline and a programme of work organised around it. And as you no doubt will hear from officials and I've no doubt I'll hear even through the progress of the meeting that we're taking each section of the statement because we del I deliberately laid it out in sections and we're putting together a programme of work around each of those, including timelines. I've no doubt part of this will mean perhaps amending current legislation or looking at new bits of legislation for some aspects of it. So the quicker we get this done and through the, the legislative and committee process in the assembly, the better. Um, so it's just a... Uh, um, try and give some assurance around that. I fully understand your point around holding the housing executive to account because we're all MLAs, we've all had difficulties um, and the constituents that we represent and even those here in our constituency and other constituencies are living with the legacy of poor insulation 
They've got respiratory problems, they're dampness, they're spending additional money on decoration and all the rest. Um, that's even before you talk about the impact on their mental health and well-being. Um, but you will remember um, that the Savage report, going back a few years ago, recommended that at least £7.1 billion was needed to look after the maintenance of at least um, there are 85,000 homes, but certainly, even at a conservative level, half of those needed serious uh, remedy. And if we didn't bring forward proposals, one of the aspects that the housing executive was saying was, well, we're going to have to sell off 40,000 homes in order to have a, a proper maintenance budget. So, as part, the short answer, Alex, is there will be greater accountability mechanisms because with this funding, and with these opportunities will come conditions from me and my department. And those conditions need to be met. It's not going to provide an overnight remedy, but what it will provide is a set of clear governance and guidelines um, and targets. Because without targets, it's going to be very difficult for people like yourself and other members to hold them to account. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Robin, and then Kelly, then Andy. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, uh, like Alex, uh, welcome the statement, albeit with some caveats are, are around uh, just uh, just where the statement came. I have to say it came as a surprise. It didn't, at least I certainly wasn't aware of any uh, warning uh, or, or uh, uh, indication that, the, but it, I think it is, given some caveats, it is it is a good statement. Minister, you in the Assembly Chamber described the targets uh, set for new build as miserable targets. In 2002, we were 13,000 people in housing stress. In 2020, we have 26,000 people in housing stress, and that is a rising figure. Could I just uh, draw you to uh, the Landlord Investment Challenge, which is paragraph 5 in your statement to ourselves this morning. And the level of investment required, you said, was around £7.1 over a 30-year front-loaded to the urgent backlog with £3 billion required over the next 11 years. If this is to be achieved, Minister, the three billion over eleven years, and I'm assuming that that is at no cost to the public purse. And then, in that case, how would where would that three? What security? What would be the mechanism for securing three billion within eleven years for NIHE? So, first of all. Um, Robin, thank you for the question, and I'm surprised that you're surprised because from the day on our and that committee, and even my previous days in the DSD committee, I've had housing um, at probably the centre of everything I've done. No, I, I do um, have I do have to accept that. Uh, I, do, I know you're 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 keen on the statement of uh, this yes. new came as a surprise to me, not the fact no, that you're no. interested in housing. No, listen, and, and I accept that, but the issue is the thing that drove me to do something very quickly was the, one of the points you made. So the levels of housing stress are just rising almost by a thousand each year. And that's on top of the families who've been waiting for years and years and years. So I actually felt it was better to try and start the process without getting a perfect model to try and see what we can do, um, primarily to give people hope, to be quite frank about it. Um, and so I just want to put that in that context. The three billion over the period, I suspect, will probably raise because the 7.1 that Savills announced and the three billion came from that figure. I actually think it's more towards 7.8 or 7.9 billion in terms of the maintenance. So the housing executive have reserves in order to you know, go towards their maintenance budget. Um, and indeed, the, we will have to raise 
or take the money from within our own budget um, to satisfy those and that's going to be has to be carefully managed and planned over a period of years so I mean that's a short answer um, and as you will know even from the statement Robin that when we reclassify and redesignate the landlord side of the housing executive and allow them in, which will give them the freedom to borrow money not just to build but also to maintain at very very low rates that's the other part of the equation that we're bringing together to try and ensure that not only is there a budget there it's realistic it's planned it's coordinated and it's targeted um, at the minute, unless we change the various of the housing executive, getting rid of the historical debt and all the rest, we're literally, um, we're just going through the motions and none of us want to do that. Can I, Chair, in, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the cost to the public purse in this strategy that you're uh, uh, embarking on, I mean, I assume there's no cost to the public purse uh, in that strategy. Well, uh, first of all, in relation to the maintenance and in relation to the ability to build, what I've just said to you is the model in which I'm proposing to do it because as it stands, the cost to the public purse is current. It's the status quo. Um, we need to reduce that. Um, but as we roll out our timelines and roll out the different models and different approaches, not just for the housing executive, but also for the private rented sector, um, the cost of the public purse at the minute, particularly in terms of housing benefit, is massive. So not only am I hoping to ensure that those costs are reduced, I'm also hoping that people get better value for their money, um, but more importantly, that the quality of their lives is greatly increased. And for me, that is my raison d'etre uh, in terms of keeping the costs down, looking at ways in which we can do that and improving better outcomes for people, both um, in the public and indeed in the private rented sector. Chair, sure, uh, really, in, in terms of, uh, Minister, in terms of the restructuring of the housing executive to allow it to borrow uh, money i'm assuming that there's no cost to the public purse in that no not at this stage robin but as you will appreciate it's early days the restructuring in my opinion is a matter of bringing forward in the same way we did with the reclassification of housing associations we need to bring forward a model be it a mutual or cooperative to redesignate um, we will need to look at options, but you know, see at this stage, um, I, I don't envisage costs for that to happen. And if they are costs, they need to be dealt with in house. Thank you. Can I just ask then about the, the current ground or the current footprint that the housing executive owns? And I'm thinking in terms of footprint, I'm thinking of the 33 high towers, the uh, tower blocks. Will the housing executive be retaining the footprint of any properties that they have to demolish? Uh, I, I would imagine yes, because it's their property. So if they have to demolish tower blocks, then it's their tar blocks, it's their land, and it has to be their creekback. But that's not the case at the minute, where if they knock a building down, such as, you know, we've had correspondence on, on some properties. So if the housing executive have to demolish properties, then they will retain the ownership of that footprint. Um, Absolutely, they should be. So if you have evidence or if you have examples, Robin, where that's not the case, I would, I would like to say what they are because it's public land and it should be for public housing. Yeah, that's me, Chair. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, I've got then Kelly, Andy and then Fra. 
Thank you very much, Fair, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, just to go back to the point that Robin was making, um, whenever we have the, the issue when the housing executive splits and the landlord function moves over, um, this is where uh, Robin was, I think, I'm probably going to ask this, a similar question to that. So when the landlord function moves over, it effectively becomes like a social housing um, association. Um, on that basis, then, um, are, are you in thinking that the housing executive, the landlord function, will then retain those assets? I'm just thinking about the days when I worked um, in asset transfer with... Um, merge and charities and things like that there one of the due diligence was and and bear with me on this one i'll explain why because i don't want this to come back and hit the department quite hard um whenever an asset transfer happened if the asset wasn't at a a, a state that was good enough then the, per the person who was taking on that asset come looking for repairs and i'll give you an example of that um, whenever the councils took over um the car parks um, during the, the amalgamation of councils and um, took that over from the Department of, uh, for Infrastructure. They then came back at the department looking for the maintenance money to upgrade and, and maintain those council car parks, those now council car parks. So I'm just wondering if there's a, I know that you've said that the housing executive have a huge reserve, but it is log jammed and there will be known liabilities within that reserve. But I'm just wondering, will then that landlord function be looking to, towards you to make up um, you know, all the repairs that are required um, and the money for all of those repairs so that they then have an asset that's that's as new as can be that they can then move forward with? Well, I, I think we're getting too technical about this. So let, just let me just clear this up. Um, the designation, the rebranding, call it what we may, is public. It will be have the public interest at heart um, so even though, for example, we know already that from the 85,000 homes that the landlord side has in the housing executive, it's the biggest landlord, social landlord in these islands, at least half are in a state of disrepair, almost to the point where they, as I said in response to Robin, that we need a massive capital injection, okay? Yeah. So we know it's not... The case that there'll be any surprises we know what is needed um so those assets are in the public interest so whatever budget um whatever state of liability they're transferred there'll be a clear understanding that they're transferred to make good and to make right and that's come back to the whole the whole question of will the landlord say you know, be expected to do A, B or C or D. We can't ask people to do and take certain actions without giving them budget headlines that they need. That's the whole point of doing this. So the short answer is whatever public liability there are in terms of their assets, part of the statement was to ensure that we bring these homes into the 21st century. We make sure that they're safe, they're clean, they're appropriate to people's needs and we have a massive budget to work through over a period of years and we need to give the landlord side of the housing executive, we need to clear the decks for them to allow that to happen. That's the reason why we're doing this. Okay. Thank you, Minister, because that, that actually leads on to my next question um, because with the new landlord function, which is which we'll I'm absolutely in support of, um, will come the opportunity for them to be able to borrow. And the last thing that we would want to do is for them to all of a sudden have to borrow huge amounts of money um, to make good those houses. And then ultimately, as you said, you want to keep the rental, you know, of housing executive houses at, at, at an affordable rate. But if if the renters, the tenants, are going to have to help pay back that massive amount of loan, then it counterbalances that. Um, so I'm just. I just wanted to check as well, um, in, is there an intention whenever the housing executive landlord part breaks off or, or moves away um, that the not just mixed tenancy but shared housing will be a focus of theirs because that's come through from TPUC from the executive office and I'm quite keen that that, that will be one of their um, agenda items going forward that one of their targets is to, to maintain that shared housing as the housing executive and social housing currently has. Yeah, absolutely. But Kelly, my um, obligation and my duty is to look at 
the equality duties and indeed the failure of the housing anxiety to meet their equality duties, particularly around the housing stress figures, the adoptions that people need. We're failing in those because there are people with huge mobility illnesses, life limiting illnesses, disabilities that we can't meet because of the configuration. So to give the assurance, I will faithfully respect and promote and continue the TBOC in terms of shared housing. But I also have to say that the biggest and overwhelmed demand is for homes. Um, and it's homes where people are at the point of need now, providing people the options and choices that they want um, around shared housing is also a priority, but it's not one or other, it's both. And the main issue for me at the minute is I am completely anxious about the levels of difficulties that people are living in, particularly around their mobility issues and the, the lack of quality of life that they have because we haven't been able to do the much needed adaptions. And for me, that's my pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I have no issue feeling the pressure off, but that that is completely unacceptable the way families and people are living in a situation where they're bumping up and up, up and downstairs on their backsides when they really need downstairs bathrooms and they've no privacy even to get a shower. It's just ridiculous in this day and age and it's really unfair. Yeah, I, I absolutely support that um, as part of the all party group on disability and, and having my lovely hearing problems. Um, absolutely would wish to see that mixed tenure, but I'm just concerned of, of what has happened in more recent years with social housing is that beautiful developments, absolutely beautiful developments have been put up, mm -hmm. lovely houses, but because of the allocation, um, the shared housing has gone out the window. And to be honest, they are, are segregated um, cul-de-sacs and, and, and areas um, that have become quite difficult for the tenants because they're... they're uh, say, like, to be honest, we all know that there's paramilitary intimidation has happening in some of those areas, or criminal intimidation, but if we can develop a more shared housing um, approach, which has the mixed tenure, then that can help to um, make a inclusive society as opposed to um, parts of society that go into housing where they're almost like corralled into an area and that gives opportunity for people to um, go in, be loan sharks, you know, start to intimidate, put pressure on people. Um, so that's why I'm keen just that, that the f future focus includes that TBUC identification that we're not creating um, closed off areas, that we, we also have the mixed tenure where everybody with all abilities can live there, but everybody can live there. It's not just segmented, but thank you very much. I'm just supposed to add on to that point that Kelly made. I mean, you, Minister, you and I both know the shared housing <coughs> development at Felden. Um, mm -hmm. ending up an absolute disaster. So it did and didn't go. It was supposed to be shared housing and didn't end up. So there's a lot of work needs to be yeah. done around that and bringing communities um, forward yeah. um, and that because we've seen there that it couldn't be forced um, because it just wasn't going to work. Um, so there, I think there's a lot more work needs done around that um, because, as I say, communities need to be ready for that. Uh, mm -hmm. to happen. Just a, on a side point, sorry to come in there. Um, I've Andy and then Afra. Uh, nobody else has come in to say they want to speak, so Andy? Yeah, sure, and uh, thank you. I would, I would echo your, your point around Felden. When I first came into politics, I was, I was involved in the Felden development, and um, what was noticeable to me was, you know, the, the work on the ground still needs to be done with those communities to, to move forward in that respect, and not just coming in and building those projects and hoping that they will be successful. In that respect, Minister, um, I, I wish we had longer with you, and I'll try to keep my my comments brief um, to allow colleagues to come in. Uh, I'll, I'll jump to an area we haven't really touched on: the housing selection scheme. Um, and I know, obviously, uh, the housing selection scheme um, isn't just an issue in isolation, um, because we we can tinker and change the housing selection scheme all we want. And if we're not, but if we're not building the houses, it's not going to have a significant impact. But the housing selection scheme, many constituents, and I'm sure you're the same and, and colleagues around the table are the same, would highlight the unfairness of it um, and their inability to be able to get the points that they believe they deserve to get housing. So you'd recommend that of the 20 uh, recommendations in the 2017 consultation that 18 of those are going to be taken forward. When are they likely to be taken forward and when are we likely to see that being used as a framework for allocating housing points? So th thanks, Andy. Um 
And the issue for me is that um, I feel at times we're just tinkering around the edges. And while a fundamental review and the allocation of points was a fundamental review, um, for me, we it didn't address the heart of the problem, which was increasing supply to reduce demand. So the housing selection scheme and the ability to progress this has already started. We're, you'll be talking to my officials when I leave, but we're looking at ways. So there, I think it was in relation to the point that Alex Eason started with, how long will it take each of that statement, each of those points in that statement we're currently working through the paragraphs, we're currently working through the sections and putting a timeline to it as much as possible. But to be totally honest, and you've you've hit the nail on the head yourself, while the 18 recommendations that I've accepted going forward will go forward, fundamentally at the bottom of this, we need to increase the supply. And that's, for me, that's, that's at the heart of this. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, I totally agree because you're always going to have that um, that issue and that impact on the ground. Really? In reality, if you don't yeah. have the houses to allocate to people, um, and, and I know from my extensive engagement and engagement with the housing executive and that of my team, you know, uh, housing solutions, for example, was brought in to try to uh, change the experience of constituents with the housing executive, and, and I know from speaking with those uh, housing solution teams, they're <coughs> overwhelmed, they're under pressure, um, and they just don't have the resources at hand to be able to deliver, and, and I would just encourage Minister to maybe perhaps look at that if you're not already, you know, th those housing solution teams are, are, as I understand it, under significant pressure, and, and, one of, and I know it's slightly digressed a bit, but when they go off, um, there's often their cases are left lying on a desk, and to put it bluntly, and, and, and there's no updates with those constituents. So that, that, that's a, a current issue I would encourage uh, to be looked at, and I've put a couple of table questions in respect to that. Minister, to come back, and I know, I know you'd highlighted, um, we're getting very technical, and forgive me, I'm going to try to come, bring it back to the technical level. Um, and obviously, given that we uh, have gone through a whole process around uh, ONS reclassification of housing associations and, and what you're proposing, and, and you've mentioned a cooperative or mutual type body um, for the landlord element of the housing executive, can you give us more, uh, more of an indication at this stage what that's going to look like? Is, is, is the housing executive landlord function going to, going to become a super housing association? And you know, what considerations are you given uh, around any potential impact or oversight from ONS in respect to that? Because at the moment, obviously, the way we account technically, um, if the Housing Executive were to borrow, and I'm talking in hypotheticals, um, that would come onto the public purse, but in, in under the different model, that would be obviously completely different. So I, I sort of look at it that it will become a super housing association. And, and as an aside to that, how will that super housing association um, interface with the, the already established housing associations to ensure uh, that they are getting value for money because you know a lot of the housing associations already have a lot of, of experiences in, in, in these areas and the housing executive because they haven't been building for quite a long time um, will be coming into the market as, as, as the new guys in, in an extent and, and, and a third aspect is is the land um, but I'll touch on that next. There's one day about now Andy. The, la the land aspect? Yeah. The yeah. key here is, is obviously um, we, we can implement all of these changes, uh, Minister, um, but quite often when I interface and engage with uh, those wanting to build housing or social housing, they continually bring up with me one planning or two, the availability of land. And I know your, your colleague, the Minister of Finance, has been um, looking at a land registry in, in respect of trying to identify available plots of land to build social housing. So maybe where we are with that, um, because that's a huge a huge area that we need to look at also. Okay, so Andy, thanks for your questions. Um, so let me just clarify something. I don't want this to be a super housing association. Okay. So just, I'm deeply uncomfortable with even that description. And I'm aware that others have used it in the past. And that's why I'm looking at the whole idea of a mutual or a cooperative. Because, so under the designation, the, of the landlord side, we're going to have to set up separate bodies, a separate, you know, oversight body, which will report and all the rest of it, but it still has to have a public reporting mechanism, which is accountable, adheres to the same level of governance, and then some. So I don't want people thinking, because there has been a lot of criticism 
uh, a lot of praise also, but a lot of criticism over the way some house associations operate. Uh, and I don't want that to happen for here. So it's just to give, I want to give you that assurance. Um, so that landlord said, should it be a cooperative or a mutual, will be accountable to the department. And that's, that is something that I am I'm completely clear about. Uh, I do understand there will be separate reporting and accountability mechanisms, but the, the mechanisms will be there. Um, the value for money aspect of it is, is that we need to ensure that we keep the rents the lowest on these islands because already a housing executive home is below currently below seventy pounds a week, and some housing associations are charging over one hundred and twenty pounds a week, and that's that for me. So the the answer to this is this redesignation isn't about doing it in order to increase rents to that level. That's not the solution for me. Um, so I just want to get that out there. But the issue around the land, so you're aware that Connor Murphy is looking at the land registry and currently at the minute some departments are holding on to their land and they're not deeming them surface to requirements. Okay. Some of the departments don't even have a proper register of their lands and Despite the great work that's gone on around public housing or public land for public housing, we're still not getting a true complexion of what's available out there. So I'm I have engaged extensively with Connor. Our officials have done so also. I want a position where departments have to give the assurance to the Minister for Finance that they don't need the land rather than the other way around. So I'd like the criteria shifted, almost turned 360 round. So departments have to give a rationale why they're holding on to the land rather than just, you know, declaring it surplus. And um, because I do think that will change the complexion of land availability. I also believe that there has been quite a lot of land banking in certain areas by developers, mm -hmm. particularly with the whole NAMA debacle where some developers under NAMA or service were able to buy land, you know, have it taken over and then buy back again at a peppercorn rate, not peppercorn, but certainly a greatly reduced rate. And they're sitting on that, hoping that the market turns and all the rest of it. So I think we also need to get into discussions through SIB and anybody else um, to have conversations with those developers to see what position they're in. Because let's be honest about this. While the focus is about homes and people, and that is, we have brilliant opportunities, massive opportunities to have a great construction boost. We have an opportunity for people who've been long-term unemployed coming back to renew and refresh their skills. And for apprentices who've never had the opportunity at all, um, to get involved in the construction industry through this housing development program. So I'm really, really keen that, as I used to say before, to clear as many decks as possible, because I believe the way in which land has been dealt with, in my opinion, has been too lax. Thanks, Minister, and, and I'll be very brief. Two, two more points, because I appreciate we're, we're pushed for time now nearly. Um, and you do make fundamental points, and Minister, um, I, I am glad to see this 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 statement in the revitalisation, an ambitious revitalisation, if I might add, because as you say, tinkering around the edges, what we've done for for years, clearly isn't working. Um, I, I don't want to get fixated on the the the, the technical nature of um, what the body will look like or the model, but given we've been through the the whole process with ONS, and you mentioned about wanting to this new body or, or the restructured housing executive landlord function, you want that to still have the public accountability, and and we know from the ONS process that obviously the reclassification of housing associations from private to public bodies. From a technical accounting perspective, that then put their borrowing on, on the public purse. Yeah. What what consider are you giving consideration to that at this stage around the, the technical nature of that with the ONS? Is, are your officials engaging with the ONS as to try to foresee any potential issues down the line where ONS might might come in and uh, and highlight issues in that respect? And the final point, and I think uh, a key fundamental point of all of this, Minister, and, and I know you'll you'll agree, is is the tenants. 
It's those tenants in those houses and it's important that they're engaged with and they will be hearing a lot of this high level stuff now and wondering you know, what, what everybody's talking about, what that'll look, what relationship that's going to have for them and fundamentally in, in many respects uh, that will be affordability um, for them but at what stage are you going to be in a position and again um, I know it's difficult uh, around timelines, are you going to be in a position to give those tenants uh, a vision as to what things are going to look like and what level of say will they have in um, the new body? So, Andy, you've obviously, you know, got a lot of questions there and I could spend the next five minutes answering them and from a calm won't get in and I'm going to have to deal with him later. I'll so, need in a Sam Mark Darkin because they're all still waiting. <laughs> yeah, so um, to be fair, um, just very, very quickly, ONS has been reclassified that many times people are getting mixed up. So it's public, private, public, private. Yeah. So, um, and that's the problem. Okay. But let me get, give you a reassurance. We need to keep the pressure on the public purse down. We need to ensure tenants see an uplift in their terms and conditions and their quality of life. And we need to make sure that when we have the proposals all, you know, topped and tailed, everything ready to go, that there will be consultation, not because at the moment we're getting quite a lot of interest. People are heartened that they feel that their lives are going to be improved um, as a result of this announcement. So it's early days, we're working our way through it. But will tenants be consulted? Absolutely they will. And that includes the consultation I want to have, and I'll finish in this, is current tenants. If there's new allocations, uh, the pre-allocation support is there. People are supported through their tenancy and those tenancies will be sustained better. But for people who are living in really awful conditions at the minute, they're going to definitely, everybody's going to be consulted. Uh, and I want to use as an imaginative uh, and, uh, and as progressive way as a consultant as possible, not just a letter when it's all done. So that's the assurance I want to give you. Thanks, Minister. Okay, thanks, Andy. Okay, as I say, the Minister has three minutes left, but officials will be staying on. So I've got Fra, then Sinead, and Mark. So go to you first, Fra, and if you can ask your questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Andy, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, uh, you're welcome, obviously, to the meeting this morning. I think <laughs> there's been quite a number of questions asked this morning, and uh, the uh, I think the, the, the main question runs to the, the, the a lot of questions that have been asked is accountability. And knowing you for many years, that that has always been uh, the, 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 the top of your uh, push uh, to ensure things, especially. But one of the, one of the questions uh, I think that has been asked, and I've spoken to many people uh, from your announcement, and uh, I haven't found one person uh, that did not support the thing. They all believe uh, that... Uh, that it's they've waited years and years for a minister to come in and to to take this bold step uh, on uh, on poisoning, but uh, the 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 housing associations, uh, housing executive and whoever uh, who have manipulated <coughs> the, the the allocation figures in terms of uh, the uh, bills and announcements and things like that there in the short term can. Can can we uh, get that have that dealt with? Uh, to ensure that what what we hear is uh, the 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 right position of thing. And I uh, secondly, uh, is there any way in terms of the list of things that we have done that there would could be some quick wins? And I know they've talked about the uh, the, the, the 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 housing selection scheme uh, and, and ensuring that those people who are entitled to homes are there people who would get homes rather than uh, the manipulation of uh, the, the, the point system. Okay, so um, for, I think, so two points really is, um, if I understand your question right, and thank you for all for your comments. So first of all, the reason why I'm reintroducing ring fencing is it was, it was removed. It was removed by Margaret Ritchie and Ali Gottwood. Um, and what, what that meant was um, that there were protections for people who were living in the areas of highest demand. So that meant to say you protected the budget and built a quota of housing in those areas to try and reduce the demand. We're reintroducing that. And that should hopefully avoid what we call manipulation, although, frankly, 
Bra, I would rather just dig it more deeper into that. But I do think what, if I understand your question right, the reason why it was manipulated was because um, the uh, people misusing and abusing the intimidation points. So for me, that's what the issue was. Um, so that's why I didn't want to get rid of them because there are definitely genuine people who are intimidated. Like even, and Paul will know this, even in our own constituency, like we have asylum seekers who came here after leaving absolute misery, conflict, and they came here, put into private rented sector and all sorts of racist abuse uh, and threats of violence. And indeed, violence on some occasions in North Belfast, they had to leave their homes. So those people are genuinely intimidated, as are many, many others and many other examples. But people were misusing the system. And in my opinion, there wasn't the robust verification process to um, uh, support a genuine application for intimidation. And that needs to change. Housing associations, housing executive will all say this, uh, and they will all say that they are deeply uncomfortable with people who they didn't feel were genuinely intimidated after the fact, you know, were getting brand new houses in the most part. Um, the people who were living in housing stress for years were left languishing on the housing waiting list. So we need that to change, and that's what I'm looking at. So for me, I'm doing those things now. I'm starting to look at those options now. Um, and they, this is all done and paralleled everything else we're doing. Um, because uh, even go back to Robin's point, you know, from 2002, 13,000 people and living in housing stress, it's increasing a thousand a year. And, it's, and, it's, and it, it looks like it's going to increase that, at least that, and then some over years, and we just need to put the brakes in this. Um, Chair, um, I hope that's answered the questions. Um, I've left this to, as long as I possibly could. Um, the officials are here. I have no doubt there'll be more questions in this, um, and indeed other announcements that we'll be bringing forward uh, before Christmas. Um, but just to say that um, I, I would like to come back to meet the committee before Christmas because I'm not content with just giving 40 minutes of my time. So I'm leaving that offer for you to come back. And I've no doubt the officials who are on the call will do their best to answer questions. And I've absolutely no doubt I've received another raft of written questions from you too. But that's that's democracy. That's what it's about. So I just want to thank you for your time. And particularly doing the meeting early to facilitate me. I really appreciate that. No, and thank you, Minister, and thank you for going over the a lot of time that we had agreed with yourself. So thank you um, for that, and then we'll just carry on then with the officials. So thanks, Carol. Thanks, Minister. Okay, um, if we can bring the officials then into the the spotlight as well to answer some of the questions, that would be good. Fra, had you anything further you wanted to add? Any further questions? Can't hear, Fra. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, Fra. Go ahead. No, that, that, uh, uh, that, that's, that's okay. Sure. All right, Fra, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on then to Sinead. Sinead, can you go ahead? Thanks, Sure. Um, yeah, I suppose it's just... Um, and part of my part of my question was probably covered in Carol's answer to Andy. Um, it was just in regards to... Um, the uh, you know identifying surface public land um, and ensuring that that's uh, you know that there's the rural element is included in that because in in South Bank we have about two thousand people on, on the housing waiting list and, and of that fourteen hundred are in acute housing stress and if we take in the whole of Newry Morning Down uh, that that figure goes up to three thousand uh, people who are in acute housing stress and a lot of those people just given the nature of where we are will be in a rural setting so. Um, you know, it was just to get a better understanding of how this housing policy would um, would apply to rural dwellers and what uh, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that. Obviously, I know that Carol will be very much dealing with those uh, areas in greatest need, and we know that's North Belfast, West Belfast, uh, Derry, and, and things like that. But 
we know there is acute housing stress in rural areas too so it was just to get a better understanding of how that how the housing policy would transfer into a rural setting and also as well in terms of the point system um i know the minister has indicated she's looking at, at an overhaul of it um but we have um people who are sort of mid, mid table in terms of the point system um, and never seem to be able to change that situation in terms of, of gaining more points or whatever. So uh, they just seem to sort of languish mid, mid table going nowhere. So it was just in relation to those people and um, how we can change things around for, for those sort of mid, mid table uh, people who, are, who have sort of, you know, middle of the road points. Okay. Um, okay. Go ahead, Paul. I, um, you can hear me. Yeah, sorry, Paul Price here from um, Part of the Community. Yeah. Um, and on the on the issue of land and, and rural housing need, um, I mean the, the efforts the minister is making. First, is, first thing to say is the efforts the minister is making to public held land is all land. So we land in rural areas to address rural, rural housing need as well. Um, she's had two meetings, in fact, the minister um, in the last few months with the rural community network um, to look at how to better address housing need in their areas. Um, uh, and it's particularly focused on making sure that um, the housing executives, um, the housing executive conducts particular kinds of assessments in rural areas, um, assessments of latent need. Um, they, uh, this is an acceptance that need isn't always as obvious in these areas as it is in the urban areas, and that you need to make a special effort to identify it. And the housing executive is, is conducts these special assessment, assessments of latent need, and is looking particularly at how to make sure these particularly capture. Um, and reflect the need in these areas so that then the new build program will follow them. Um, and we're also looking at maybe are there ways in which there are certain obstacles, maybe cost, um, that present housing associations and, pre and prevent them from um, bringing forward schemes in such areas. So we're also looking at wh whether we can um, help them with those obstacles in the way we um, administer the, the new build program. A lot of this work is, only, you know, is, is, is not finished, but I mean that's how we're trying to address uh, address the need better on um, on on the on, on the list, and particularly those sort of um, the group neither at the top nor at the bottom, but in housing stress, but sort of stuck. Um, there are a number of proposals in the the review of allocations um, that will address that. Overall, all eighteen to be implemented will help the list move more quickly and more fairly. Um, but perhaps um, one to particularly mention here is that um, one of the proposals to be implemented is uh, one that will allow an assessment of points to be increased the amount of time people have spent on the list. Um, and that, that would hopefully reduce waiting times. Um, um, now, the implementation of that sort of proposal when that will happen, that will become clear when later towards the end of this month um, we will publish the plans to implement the 18 proposals. Uh, I don't want to sort of go into great detail about those plans. They are in three phases over over a period of maybe three to four years. So you'll see where that kind of change will come in in that period. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, and no, that's fair enough. Thank you. All right, Sinead, is that you finished there? Yes. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Right into okay, Sinead. Can I then um, bring in Mark, Mark Durkin? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I was a wee bit late under the meeting. I forgot about the early kick-off when I was doing the, the school run. Uh, my, I, I had more questions that were maybe a bit more political, so that they mightn't be appropriate for uh, the officials, and then one in particular on timeline that uh, Paul addressed in the, his answer to Sinead there. Just one thing, and, and the Minister is very clear what she sees that the the, the core of the problem here being around lack of supply. And like I say, I, I missed the start of the meeting, so, so she might have said it at the start. H have we any clear target or aim for the number of, of new social homes completed by the end of this mandate? We, um, we have a target mark um, for the end of this financial year. The target for the next financial year will be determined. I mean, we had plans to, um, in the context of the efforts to develop three-year resource budgets and four-year capital budgets, yeah. we of course had developed plans um, to that, that included targets for that period. However, as you as you will know, uh, 
that plan to have long-term budgetary planning has had to be uh, shelved for now. So uh, I think the accurate answer to your question is we were ready to, um, but right now all we have is the target for um, uh, 2021. Of course, you have the commitment in New Decade New Approach to increase investment um, from existing levels. So uh, you may from that have an expectation of a higher target in 21, 22 than this year's target, but remains to be seen. Okay, now thank you, Paul. But th that's fine. I have some other questions, but th they'd be more appropriate for the minister. But thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> members to Kelly, did you want to come back on something earlier? And Andy wants to as well. Yeah, sorry, just for clarification, um, I just wanted to find out um, when Sinead had talked about the pressures in in rural areas. My point is on the same area. Um, what I'm finding is that councils do have an extraordinary amount of land, and while they're independent um, entities and have the right to sell their land, has there been any discussion with councils um, as to given the you know your Department of Community's first sort of chance to purchase that land, especially in rural areas? And the second one you'd mentioned there about the length of time on the list, we're a bit concerned about that. Um, I appreciate people who've been on the list a long time do need to be considered. But can I ask if Section 75 is going to be used proactively to create equity then on the list? Because single men have no chance whatsoever of increasing their points, even if they are fathers and have um, visitation rights with their children where they can stay overnight. But they have no chance of getting um, enough points to be allocated a house. Um, and just to clarify, when will the committee receive the updated information that we can scrutinise some of the considerations that you're talking about? You'd mentioned, was it 18 points? Um, it'd be useful if we could um, do our scrutiny role on those. Just before, can I just come in just before you answer there? Um, we've got Patrick Thompson up on our screen here as well, and I know Patrick's not due to brief us until, um, I think it's the, uh, the Cliff Edge um, briefing, so he's gone off our screen. I just didn't want because uh, uh, Patrick wouldn't have known he was on the screen there, albeit he was having a lovely cup of tea and I'd like one myself. Um, so he's gone off the screen again. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, David or Paul? Um, I'm going to take the allocations questions first. Um, on, the, on the concern, Kelly, you mentioned about any, any time-banding system having a quality dimension. I mean, we have of course, submitted this proposal and um, uh, all of the others, not just to a quality screening, but full impact assessments um, yeah. hitherto. And we, we will maintain that. I appreciate that, but Section 75 is used as a tick box. I'm looking for it to be used more proactively to create equity. A quality screening just says that you're not discriminating against somebody. I'm actually looking for positive discrimination here so that that there are groups like those who have been languishing on the list, as, as Sinead had mentioned, um, single men. You know, there has to be a bit more proactivity made on this list. I, uh, indeed, I, I completely agree. Um, there, there was no tick box exercise here. I, 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 it's why I'm clear that it wasn't just screened. A full impact assessment was conduct, conducted on our, our, our proposals. Uh, we think they're consistent with increasing and addressing present inequalities in the scheme. But of course, we will maintain that as we now move into the implementation phase. So there'll be more to tell you about this, I think, um, as we continue to brief you on it. Um, the, what I'm referring to here is the, um, that will be published at the end of the month and that will include a high level action plan for implementation of the 18 changes the minister wishes to implement. I'm referring to the report on the draft, on the consultation um, on the fundamental review that has been expected for some time now. Um, so um, um, absolutely the committee will get a briefing on that um, when, we, when we get it out, if that's OK. Thank you. Um, the issue about councils and land, look, I'm gonna, do you mind if I take that one away? I, um, I, want I, to... I, could, I could say a bit, but not necessarily about rural land. Um, through our public land for housing project, we have worked with our regeneration colleagues, um, in particular Belfast City Council, and Alpha City Council have um, geographic information system computerized all of their land holdings. And in the public land for housing project, we also tried to computerize all, we had also computerized our land holdings and the housing executive done the same. And as the minister alluded to, one of the issues that she's addressing with the Minister of Finance is trying to get all the other public sector land holders to do the same, put it all together in a big database, then we can interrogate it. Um, so that work 
was taking photographs, I said, council and identified areas of land where we held bits of the land and they held bits of land. And when it all got put together, then it made developable sites that were being taken forward for housing. So there's areas at the back of Castle Court and around there, which my regeneration colleagues are taking forward um, and putting out development briefs for housing, housing that will include social and affordable housing under Belfast's um, Belfast planning conditions. I would encourage you to look at other councils outside of Belfast because I'm watching rural areas having park and rides. Translink seem to be able to get a hold of this land very easily. Park and rides in areas where there's desperate need for social housing. Um, and instead of housing, it's being used for other purposes. Very good purposes, I have to say, but rural areas just seem to be ignored. Um, you know, not everybody lives in Belfast. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Andy and then Robin want to come back in again. Andy? Thanks, Chair. Um, Paul, just to pick up on Mark's point um, around um, housing targets, and you'll probably recall when you were last at the committee, you had highlighted that um, due to coronavirus, and um, understandably, um, we didn't meet our target for the previous financial year. Are you able to give any more information on the, the work that the department has undertaken to make sure that we not only achieve our, our current target of at least 1,850 this financial year, but also bring online those 1,000? Um, I've asked the minister the same question, um, and I would hope to see that we're going to obviously deliver all of those houses and we're not going to fall short. Um, a number of things. And at the moment, we're on track. I mean, at the moment, the, we, we're looking to... Um, meet and exceed the target, hopefully. So um, it's early days, of course, this year. As you know, a lot of the action happens towards the end of the last quarter. So, but at the moment, it, it looks OK. Um, the number of things we're doing, we've confirmed recently the grant arrangements with housing associations that will endure for the rest of the year. Uh, we have special provisions set up to address them with the difficulties of COVID. We're looking to introduce changes to make the approvals process um, quicker this year so that there isn't the chance of losing a scheme and losing the spend and losing the units. Um, because of a failure in that. Um, uh, we've just recently had a very significant um, decision about a massive scheme uh, in Glenmona, a planning decision around that, and that's a really big boost this year. Um, it looks so it looks okay. Um, the big uncertainty, of course, is um, continuing the public health context, obviously, and what impact should that significantly worsen or should restrictions have to significantly increase what impact that may have on, on the eventual output and the confidence of contractors and associations to, to sign and get on site. Um, but at the moment, it looks OK. Appreciate that and appreciate, obviously, there are um, various different difficulties. But just to clarify, none of the schemes, the 1,000 that weren't brought online from the previous financial year, have been lost at this stage? Uh, look, uh, I, I, I couldn't... I can broadly say yes to you, um, you know, if... I can't speak for every scheme in that, that was involved in, in those 1,100 units that dropped out towards the end. They are the, the general point, yes, they are the basis of our confidence for and our prediction that we'll meet the target this year. OK. Um, and just, just on the another point, um, the, you'll recall the legislation, obviously, we took forward for housing associations around the reclassification ONS, and within that... Um, the house sale scheme was a, a, a point that was raised quite quite um, quite in depthly, and, and one of the elements within it was included a clause around a voluntary scheme. Now, at, at the stage when that was brought forward, no information to any great extent could be provided. Is there any more information in relation to that? Um, what what the voluntary scheme might look like, and also on, as an add-on to that, um, I'd imagine obviously the ministers highlighted the the housing executive house sale scheme. Is there any more uh, information in respect of that? The, the minister's statement committed to us bringing forward a consultation on the housing executive sales scheme um, very soon. We're, we are working very hard on that at the moment to try and get that out in the next couple of weeks. Um, on the, the provision in the housing amendment bill relating to voluntary schemes, I mean, what that was about was enabling a minister, should a housing association wish to run a voluntary scheme, to have the option of supporting that wish with with grants, if the minister, you know, a discount, if the minister wished to. Um, so, in a sense, um, that's it. That's done. That you know, that exists now on the statute book. Should a housing association, that there is no what's happened, what's changed here is the government no longer obliges a housing association to run a house sales scheme, yeah. uh, and and and. 
What's changed now is that there is the option for a housing association to run a sales scheme and a minister is equipped with the option of supporting them with a grant if they make that decision. Yeah. So the, the, next, the, next, the next development on this would be for a housing association to decide it wished to run such a scheme. Um, so, as, as, you know, you, you might want to check with associations if they have any long-term interest in doing this. Yeah, no, no, and I appreciate that, and, and there may well be housing associations who do not wish to take forward a scheme, because I do know fundamentally a lot of them had um, difficulties with the house sales scheme, but what, what I was trying to, to, to garner out was, is there any more information on what that grant might look like, how much that might be, etc., etc., so we have more information at this stage to, to have a better understanding of that voluntary scheme? Uh, I, there's no further information on that point. I expect you would only, you'd only get to that sort of consideration were a housing association to come to us with proposals for a voluntary scheme uh, supported by our grant, um, um, supported by our discount, excuse me. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um, I have one more question, Chair, and then I'll leave it. I could probably go on for the rest of the day, <laughs> but I will leave it. Um, the uh, social housing development uh, plan, um, there's obviously a mention of that within the, the statement, and it highlights two two areas specifically, um, which are, if I can find it here, uh, policy, I think, uh, strategic policy output and budget. Is there any more detail around that, uh, the Minister's thinking, uh, in order to increase uh, the house building moving forward? Um, that, I think those references are to her, her statement of intent to reintroduce ring, fence, ring fencing. Yeah. Is that, is, that, is that, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Is that the I mean, only element, though, Paul, within the, when, when she mentions the budget and the, the policy, wider policy of uh, social housing development plan, is that the only element she's looking at, or are there other elements? Uh, I think in the speech, she certainly was going to ring fencing and her efforts to try and increase, increase output in areas of acute need, and she named some areas. Yeah. Um, generally, yes, I mean, she has, we are taking forward a series of immediate, mid and long term changes to the programme to make it better at targeting areas of acute need, and ring fencing would be one of those. Um, we're looking to the housing executive to, to operationalise, to give us options to operationalise what the Minister is talking about, and that's yet to happen, so there will be more detail on that later. But the other thing we're doing is to try and increase the output of the programme per se, so build more houses in areas where they're more, they're, they're, the need is great, but also just build more houses um, to try and increase supply. Um, there are a number of things, and that's a, a lot of the things necessary to do that are, are quite long-term. They're to do with um, making sure we have the infrastructure connections, we have the land supply, but most particularly also, of course, um, that we have the budget. And I was saying to Mark earlier, we were embarked on a process that would have hopefully confirmed budgets and hopefully confirmed increased budgets for the next um, few years, but that that hasn't continued, which is a which is a which is a difficulty. I hope that answers your question. In part, uh, one more chair. Uh, apologies, um, and I appreciate it if you can't answer this, Paul or, or, or David. Um, how much of this, uh, all of these uh, changes, are achievable between now and dissolution in March twenty twenty two? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, as the published, in, when we published the consultation report on the fundamental review of allocations, um, I expect we will have implemented or started to implement a number of those 18 changes before the end of the mandate. Um, Minister is clear on ring fencing that the plans that the housing executive will publish, the, the new build plans social new build plans that will publish in this new year, in January. And they, they, they uh, stretch out over the, the, the next three years. They will reflect her ambitions of, um, of ring fencing. Um, on reclassification of the housing executive, um, the Minister's statement is clear she will, she's bringing back proposals to the executive before the end of the mandate. Um, uh, and then on the expansion of the SHDP per se, um, if we get an increase in budget in 21-22, so this year we had 131 million, if we get an increase in budget, 
you will see an increase in targets and hopefully an increase in output before the end of the mandate. Thanks very much, Paul. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, on, do you want okay. to know on my side? Yeah, it's, go ahead, it's a, sorry, there's a mix. Sorry, Chair. It's a very good question. There's two sets of stuff. There's um, things which we're going to work hell for leather to get done by the end of the mandate, um, private rented sector bill, but that is fairly limited as to the work, the preparation work that's been done up to this point. The minister has ambitions beyond that, and I, I know most of the committee would share a lot of those ambitions. Um, so things like uh, introducing grounds for evictions or things like that would take longer, and it, much the same with uh, taking forward our intermediate housing options. There is a lot is going to happen by the end of this mandate. Um, you'll have seen that even last week we announced a four-year funding deal for co-ownership, which will secure the future of that organisation. But in terms of bringing on other types of intermediate housing, there's a lot of work going on, but it, it'll take time before we actually start to see people moving into um, something like an intermediate rent house or something like that. So very much our work is split into two bits, the bits where we're going to build foundations to build on in the future, and then the things which we're going to work very, very hard to get done in this mandate. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Robin as the only one I have left that wants to make further comment. Could anybody on Starleaf, if they want to make further comment, please press their hands up button for me. Go ahead, Robin. Okay, thank you, Chair. And can I just, uh, I, I wasn't quite clear. <coughs> Alex, at, uh, sorry, Alex, Alex Eastwood started, <laughs> East and even. Uh, Alex Easton started the conversation around the upgrading of the landlord's stock and particularly about the energy ratings uh, mm. of dwellings and so on. Uh, and the information tells us that the, it's 7.1 billion over 30 years and 3 billion over the next uh, 11 years. I wasn't quite clear of the minister's answer as to where that was coming from because the landlord can only afford half of the annual investment um, from its current rental. <clears throat> so can you tell me where the balance of that three billion uh, would come from, or indeed the balance of the 7.1 billion uh, will come from without it impacting on the public purse. And yes. the minister said that she would not be creating a super housing association. So if it's not going to be that type of uh, organisation, can you maybe outline to us what the type of organisation it might be? Um, I, can, um, I can do both of those. Um, um, the question about the three billion, um, I suppose the easiest way to answer this is that if we don't change the housing executive landlord, then um, of that three billion, from its rental income, the housing executive can afford about 1.5 billion to around 2 billion. And that, uh, therefore, if we, I stress, if we don't change the landlord, um, the public purse will have to fund the balance. And um, that would be an entirely new pressure on our capital allocation. There is currently no funding, uh, or very little. Uh, apart from India funding that is passed to the housing executive landlord to deal with its investment needs. Um, so we would need, the executive would need to find a new billion to give to the housing executive, and that more or less is the entire budget we would have over the period for social housing new build, which is why the minister's statement sort of made the choice, made the point that if we don't change the housing executive, then meeting its investment requirement is essentially a choice between the investment needs of our old homes and the housing stress need to build new homes. Now, if we do change the housing executive landlord as the minister's statement set out so that it can borrow without that borrowing scoring in public expenditure terms, then the same math applies. The housing executive's rent can still afford about 1.5 billion to 2 billion of that 3 billion. But the balance, it doesn't have to get from government, it can borrow commercially without that borrowing scoring. So that's, that's the key point. In changing the housing executive, uh, if you like, the Northern Ireland executive no longer faces a liability of between a billion and 1.5 billion to keep the housing executive portfolio sustainable. You asked a, a really important separate question, which is, is there a cost to making the change? And the minister is, was clear that um, I shouldn't say there wouldn't be one, but we weren't clear on what it, you know, if there was to be one, it would be extremely small. And that's exactly right. Um, relative to the liability we would face, 
public costs we would face if we didn't do anything, which I stress would be between a billion and 1.5 billion, and that's on out-of-date figures that will go up. Relative to that, the cost of changing is insignificant. Um, sorry, the second point um, was about the minister doesn't want it to be a super housing association. She's very clear that, um, and, and look, work is beginning here. So we, we want um, quite an innovative model here in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, we're going to look far and wide really to see um, where to draw it from. There are examples of cooperative and mutuals in England um, of, of really quite some scale that I think we, we're going to look at. Um, but she, she, she's really clear she wants what, something we don't have anywhere across any of our housing associations here is, is, is a model that apes benefits of public ownership, perhaps by having as much tenant presence in the, within the governance structures as possible and by having um, as many links to government as possible and are consistent with reclassification. I think that's as much as I could say at the moment because this is two weeks after a statement of intent and the work has yet to be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Robin. Chair, can I just make one more point? Yes, Andy, you can. Um, Paul, just to pick up on that point off the back of Robin, um, and, and I get the Minister's vision, um, but I think what you're describing is going to be very difficult to achieve, to, to accommodate both sides of, of what, what you're pointing out, obviously, the Minister's vision of creating that cooperative and, uh, or mutual type body but not going to the extent of being a housing association, but also then not fall foul of ONS. So I don't envy the work in, in respect of that, but very much appreciate it if you could keep us in, in the loop in terms of detail on that, because I still can't get my head around how you're going to reconcile all of those different uh, component parts um, and not come up against uh, ONS. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's... Um... I mean, difficult. I wouldn't say difficult. It's certainly challenging. The, um, um, but it's the kind of tension that's always important to reconcile in policy development, isn't it? I mean, there is there is a. The objective is to secure the ability to borrow. Um, therefore, um, you, you, we can't have an option that endangers reclassification. And you asked the question about whether we're developing policy with ONS with this very danger in mind. I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, we're not because ONS doesn't do that. Um, it, it reflects on policy decisions that governments make and makes decisions about them. It doesn't contribute to the policy making process beforehand. But of course, what we are doing, having just gone through that process of then reflecting on our housing legislation in respect of our registered housing associations, we are, of course, applying that learning to how we solve the conundrum that you just set out. A difficult but not impossible. And, uh, and at this early stage, you know, it seems to me what we're after here is something that will be reclassified, but, but, but provides the maximum account of public account amount of public accountability within that. That's a reasonable objective. No bother. Cheers, Paul. Okay, Andy. Now you sure you finished? I'm probably not sure, but um, <laughs> I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Okay. Oh, oops, there. I see Fran McCann's hand has just shut up. Yeah. Like I thought you were last yeah. there, Andy. But go ahead, Fran. Yeah, can you hear me? I can indeed. Well, and I think Andy raises a very vital person. I think all the questions uh, that people have asked here uh, that, that are obviously crucial and important. Uh, but I think the minister continuously says what she's doing is, is putting down a challenge. And it's a challenge that we have to meet. If we don't meet it, the consequences uh, would, 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 would be very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, I think it, it, as what, what, what she does is she's been very honest when she comes to the committee. And uh, the, the, what we need is support uh, from the committee uh, to ensure that at every stage of this, yes, if there's a challenge there, we meet it head on. But uh, what would we, if, if we, again, if, oh, sorry, here, if we don't, uh, if, if we don't meet them challenges, we will be looking at a whole housing sector will be totally decimated. No, I think I think you're absolutely right there, Fra. We've all known for for a number of years that some yeah. something needed to be done here. So, no thanks for that, Fra. Have you anything further? Is that you finished? No, that's me finished, sir. Sure. Brilliant, Fra. Okay, I think that is everybody finished that wanted to ask questions there. Um, David and Paul, can I thank you both um, for your no time problem. today thank as you. well? Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. All right, members, um, we're going to just take a very short comfort break before we move on, okay? Thank you. Good day. Good day.
Okay, members, um, we're going to then move on to agenda item number two, which is apologies. Apologies. Um, everybody's present and correct, so we don't have any of those. Item number three then is chairperson's business. And just to remind members that effective questioning training um, for the committee has taken place from 12 to 1 today after the meeting finishes. And this is being conducted by Kate Farher of Best Book Skills. And, and will be very useful, uh, certainly for us, um, as we go on to, to progress through the, the licensing bill. Um, then can I inform members that the meeting on the 12th of November, uh, a query was raised in relation to an underspend of £6 million, mm -hmm. uh, which members felt should be released to community and voluntary sector, if you remember. Officials have, have advised that the Charities Fund budget allocated was £15.5 million and £8.8 .8 was awarded in total to all eligible applications to the fund for the period 1st of April to 30th of September, the remaining 6.7 million uh, not does not represent an underspend, and the department proposed to offer it now to charities for the period the 1st of October to the 31st of March. And I certainly know we've got we actually we have CO3 in next week, I think, for our briefing. Um, but I, I know that the, many of the larger charities didn't apply because they had some reserves and, and felt that the, yeah. they wanted to let the smaller charities. Um, but now those reserves are severely depleted. So it's just to mention that uh, to you as well. It comes up further along as well in our. In our, in our the, the, my uh, brief as well. So, are you content to note that for the moment? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Agenda item four is draft minutes. You'll find the draft minutes of last week's meeting, the 12th of November 2020, um, in your tabled papers. Um, uh, it contains a minor amendment to the version that, that was in the meeting pack, and that's why it's in tabled papers. Are you content with the minutes of the 12th of November 2020, all members? Mm -hmm. All content? Thank you. Item agenda five is matters arising. Uh, members, um, you've been provided a page 11 with a de departmental response to community queries on the fuel poverty scheme. Um, the response highlights that the departments fund two separate schemes, as we know, the affordable warrant scheme and the boiler replacement scheme. It also highlights that following public consultation in February 20 or February 18, uh, the minister has approved changes to the eligibility criteria for the affordable warrant, increasing the income threshold from 20,000 to 23 and removing disability benefits from the calculation of income for the scheme. Um, regulations will give effect to these changes to criteria, which will increase the number of eligible households. The response states that there are currently no plans to change the income threshold for poorer replacement same. So I think that, that is to be welcome, certainly, <coughs> um, especially the disability benefits part is not taken into account. Andy, do you want to make yeah, comments sure, on that? Yeah, sure. It's a very important step. Um, <coughs> I would just encourage the department to obviously advertise that widely because that change could mean a lot of people are now eligible. Yeah, no, absolutely, and we will pass that back to them as well. Okay, then, members, <clears throat> then moving on, um, you've been provided a page 13 with the department in response to the committee queries on the support package for sports. The response states that the department is developing a business case as well as working with Sport NI on a programme that will deliver a needs-based scheme to ensure that the £15 million funding is distributed quickly and to those that, uh, who can evidence, evidence the financial losses incurred during COVID restrictions. The response highlights that the committee will be kept informed on the progress of the scheme as it develops and rolled out. Again, members, any comments or they want to make on that are happy that we move on? Yeah. Yeah, move on, okay. Then can I ask you to turn to page 15, and that's a departmental response to the committee queries on engagement with the deaf community and BRS. Um, the response highlights a range of regular engagement and communication meetings and an independent service user feedback and engagement exercise involving key stakeholders. Um, again, we have them penciled in um, some people from the deaf community and uh, department for a, a briefing in December, I think that is, um, if, if I remember correctly. Um, so are members content we move on from that as well? Yep. Okay. I think it's after Christmas. It's after Christmas, sorry, I'm being told, but I know it's not that far away. Okay, then can I ask members to turn to page 18 of their packs, and there's a department to response to committee queries on the COVID-19 Charities Fund. Um, I've already mentioned this in the Chair's brief. Um, do members want to make any further comment on, on, on that at this stage? Um, I just know also um, I think that we need to write to as well about the arts funding um, because as far as I'm aware um, that is still hasn't been finalised, that application process, and we think that money came originally in the very beginning of July. Yeah. Um, so we've been waiting quite a long time, the arts sector, to get that funding out. So can we add that on as well if members mm -hmm. are happy there too? 
Okay, and then I'm going to move on then to page 19 of your meeting packs, and that's a response from the Finance Minister to the Committee on Dormant Accounts. Um, members, any comment or query on that? I think, was Kelly, you'd brought yeah. that up. Yeah. Um, basically, ahead. this is money that's been sitting there for quite some time. It's taken a long time in planning. Um, I note that those requirements to extend um, the laying of a strategic plan in the Assembly Library, I'm not aware that it has gone there yet, but... Um, we need to see what that plan is for the the dormant accounts. I know that it's the proposal is that it's to um, to make organisations sustainable, which is great. But um, it'd be good to see that plan whenever it comes. Okay. All right. I think that is then us ready to move on to agenda item six. Are members happy enough with everything? We move on to six. Go ahead, Robin. Just a small point, Chair. Are you able to write directly to the Arch Council on the matter? Well, we can as a committee write directly to them, yes, but um, it's certainly it's it's departmental led, yeah. so we can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a briefing arranged. That's right, there is. We have a briefing arranged on that as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, members, happy enough. We move on to item six then, which is a briefing by the Cliff Edge Coalition on welfare reform mitigation measures. Um, before the briefing starts, can I inform members that yesterday the department sent a letter. Uh, for the committee in advance of the briefing today. Um, uh, I just want to highlight a few points from the letter by way of background before we move on to the briefing. The letter highlights that the current range of welfare mitigation schemes that are in place uh, it states that there, there has not yet been possible to introduce the legislation to extend the existing mitigation schemes before um, they came to a statutory end on the 31st of March. All mitigation payments from the 1st of April 2020 have been made under the authority of the relevant Budget Act, and this approach is due to continue until the uh, 31st of December 2020. The Department will look to agree a further extension to these arrangements until the 31st of March uh, 2021, if necessary. It received an allocation of $40.3 million for continuation of the welfare mitigation schemes for 2021 financial year, and it has a bid in for £42.8 million pounds for continuing existing medications for 2021-22. The letter also states that officials have been working on draft proposals for a review of the mitigations using the principle <coughs> of co-design. Um, the letter highlights that any new legislation will consider options to strengthen and improve the support available, including a pro a proposed amendments to the bedroom tax and benefit cap mitigation schemes. Again, um, members, I'm going to move uh, on f to the, the briefing, or unless any members want to make comment on that letter first before we move to briefing. Go ahead, Kelly. Just very quickly, um, to be honest, I'd like to see what the review is, um, yeah. because you know what, we're a committee, a scrutiny committee, and we don't know what they're looking at with the welfare mitigations. Is it just as is with a few tweaks? Are there any new things coming forward? Um, there's quite a lot there that would just it would be good to get an update on what their their thinking is. Yeah, um, I think it was something that this committee, whenever it was established um, back at the beginning of the year, it was something that we had highlighted as a committee that, that we wanted yeah. to see the the evidence uh, on on those mitigations, and we because we want to just make sure we are that we're doing it right, and yeah. that there's nothing further that we should. Well, we know there's plenty further that could be done, but further that should be done. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's been a bit disappointing we haven't had the, yeah. the, the chance to go through that with, with great scrutiny. Um, but, yeah, take your point, Kelly, and um, if we can if we can get any further scrutiny on that, that's certainly welcome. OK, members, I'm going to move on then to our oral briefing from the Cliff Edge Coalition. Um, we don't have any papers from them, but we, we up, I'm sure we all have a good idea of what they're going to speak to us about. Um, isn't that correct? Didn't I say that? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So can I welcome to the meeting Ursula O'Hare from the Law Centre, Kira Fitzpatrick from the Law Centre and Patrick Thompson from the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations. Um, oh, they seem to, oh. seem to have gone there. Mm. They've dropped off. Have, oh, no, they're there. Are they not? Okay, I can Where's see them? Patrick's name and I can see Kara on the screen. Or Kira, sorry, Kira. Where's, is Ursula there as well? I think it's my system has done it. Okay, we. No. <laughs> okay, I know in health committee at the moment they're having major problems with their star life and have had to suspend, so we're just oh. waiting. Ours is a bit of a problem. Yeah. Mark's having problems as well, getting in. Okay, um, then we just can we just suspend the meeting again for a few moments? Did we try and get this sorted, members? Mm -hmm. 
the committee room. Okay, members, I'm going to try opening this meeting again and see if we can get Dr. Keira Fitzpatrick, um, Patrick Thompson, and let me see, Ursula O'Hare. Oh, there, we've got them in. There we are. We're ready to go again. Sorry about that, folks. We're, the building seems to be having a few problems here with Starleaf this morning. Um, so, does Patrick, you're very welcome back. We had you in a departmental briefing earlier, so we did, and you could have answered maybe a couple of the questions there to do with housing associations. Um, but uh, so, the ears are very welcome um, to brief us uh, as part of the Cliff Edge Coalition. Um, can I? We didn't get a briefing paper from you. We are running a bit tight time at the minute, so I do want you to give us a briefing. Um, so I do, but if you could make it as not not short, but as succinct and to the point, we would appreciate that. So I'll pass over to yourselves. Okay, Ursula, we can't hear you. Is your volume button on, or or your mute button? No, it's not on. Okay. What about Patrick or Kira? Or yeah, Kira. Can you hear? Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you too. I just can't hear Ursula. So I can't. <coughs> For some reason or other. No. No. No sound at all, Ursula. Can you take your headphones off and try speaking without them? Because I know that was a problem we had with another witness. No. Still not working for us. Can I pass over? Can, can Kira or, or Patrick come in on any of this before we, we start? Would that be okay? Okay. Yeah. Kira, do you want to pick off or <laughs> will I just come to Kira then? <laughs> I like that. I like that, Patrick. <laughs> oh, I know it's completely thrown us now. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, it happens to the committee every week. We're well used to it. So if you want to use one, just to go ahead and then we'll start questions. Okay, no problem. Um, basically, if you just let me get up, Ursula, thankfully give us a little rundown of the points that uh, she was going to make today. So if you just let me get them up, okay. um, I will do that. Um, okay. So, okay. okay go ahead. So, thank you very much for providing the Cliff Ed Coalition with the opportunity to brief you today. Um, we are very, very keen to do three things in relation to moving along um, the need, the urgent need to close um, the current loopholes that are there in the welfare reform mitigation and also to consider the future priorities which are pressing as we are in the midst of this um, global pandemic which is having a devastating impact, a devastating economic impact on individuals and families across Northern Ireland. So really we would like the committee to request an urgent update from the department on the timetable for closing those um, particular loopholes, the, be the benefit cap loophole and the bedroom tax loophole, which I'll go into in greater detail in just a moment. We are asking the committee to maintain a close scrutiny of the progress including to ensure that measures do adequately close the loopholes and we're also seeking a timetable and a terms of reference for the department for the review process and committee engagement with the review process in relation to the introduction of potential new mitigations which speak to the current challenges that families and individuals are facing in regard to universal credit. So for now, I am going to talk to you about the impact of not closing the benefit cap loophole. In short, the implications include an increase in child poverty, which will in turn have a detrimental impact on the future educational and employment outcomes for our young people. And that is a grave consequence considering the already serious situation whereby we are seeing a quarter of our children living in poverty. So here's the technical bit. At present, in order to access the mitigation payment for the benefit cap, the claimant must have been in receipt of a qualifying benefit 
on the 6th of November 2016. Furthermore, it's only possible to access a welfare supplementary payment once. So if there is a break in your claim, for example, there is a family separation, you may lose entitlement. There is a nine month grace period where you will be exempt from the benefit cap if you have been employment for the previous 12 months. This means that there are that those claimants with larger families who made a claim for universal credit at the outset of the pandemic in March 2020 will be coming to the end of their nine month grace period. So to give a little bit more detail, we had a total of 46,340 claimants made a new claim to UC at the end of March 2020. And evidence has consistently shown that the benefit cap will have a bigger impact in Northern Ireland due to the larger family sizes here. As much, we are likely to see the current figures representing those affected rise significantly. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission shows an average reduction of £3,500 per year due to the benefit cap. There are some cases where losses are significantly more, depending on the individual circumstances of the family. The Law Centre, for example, recently assisted a family who, as a result of the benefit cap, has been left with just £258 per week to care for six children. This includes two children with additional needs. Housing rights are supporting a family with four kids who are facing a benefit cap of £800 per month. This has left them with a total income after housing costs that is a massive 68% below the poverty line. This means children are going without basic necessities. They are struggling to access food, heat, light and electricity. This is impacting their education and their future outcomes, as I um, mentioned before. This situation is further exasperated by the design of universal credit. The five week wait means that many families have no choice but to apply for the universal credit advance payment. Many unaware of the universal credit contingency fund, which has been underutilized. This means when they face a crisis situation, which I've seen time and time again in my own voluntary work in the community, where, whereby their cooker or fridge breaks down, they will find it much harder to access a discretionary support grant or loan, as they have reached their debt threshold under discretionary support regulations. This ultimately means that a family have no choice but to seek support from family many having to ring many different charities during these times where, as you previously mentioned, Chair, charities have seen their funds much depleted and they are severely overstretched. Evidence shows that due to the current situations, families are forced to turn to charities again and again. We know that the benefit cap is affecting around 1,000 families at the moment. And as I explained earlier, this is set to rise significantly in the context of COVID-19. Many larger families will also be hit by the two child limit, which will further intensify pain and suffering incurred by poverty. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's economic modelling shows that £3 million can protect 2,000 families from the benefit cap for the period of a year. This seems like a small price to pay when considering the long-term implications of persistent poverty. And legislation should therefore be brought forward urgently to ensure more people do not fall over this perilous cliff edge. In terms of future priorities, Cliff Edge Coalition is campaigning for new Northern Ireland specific mitigations, which should be developed to address new challenges brought forward by universal credit. This has become even more crucial as Northern Ireland starts to plan for economic recovery. In relation to universal credit specifically, colleague, or my colleague Patrick will um, talk more specific, specifically about housing related measures. We are seeking financial support for those subject to the five-week five wait and those families impacted by the two-child limit. 
and we did note the Minister's commitment to looking at this issue. And again, we would encourage action on this as soon as possible. Again, evidence shows that the two-child limit is going to have a disproportionate impact here. The policy was introduced to provide fairness to the taxpayer in ensuring families who rely on benefits must make the same decision as those who don't. But this is a misnomer for two reasons. First, two thirds of those families affected have someone in the household who is at work. And secondly, in the current situation, many families have lost their job due to no fault of their own. In regards to the two child limit, families are losing on average of £2,780 per year. So again, I can't stress enough the need to really take action on the loopholes and to seriously consider future mitigations. As I say, in my own work as a community volunteer and as an academic, the results of not taking action are absolutely devastating. And the longer this goes on, the worse it's going to get. And at that, I'm going to pass over to Patrick. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, you can all you can all hear me okay. Um, good. Um, the, a couple of areas that I wanted to touch upon on, on housing matters. One, obviously, is the immediate issue with the bedroom tax mitigation and specifically the loophole that exists with that one. Um, as you know, housing uh, allocation policy here and welfare policies don't really align. So we were very grateful when the mitigations package came out and bedroom tax part of that was introduced. Um, but there is a loophole there. Um, we know that it exists, uh, and it, it's unfair to say that bedroom tax has gone away here because of that loophole. Um, the, the mitigation can be lost if a householder moves um, to another social property where they continue to under-occupy, so they may have a spare bedroom in there. We estimate that there are about 227 people uh, who are victims of that loophole at the moment, uh, and we really need that, that, that closed. That's causing them about a 500 or £50 a month shortfall. Um, which works out for them about £600 a year that they need to find. Um, and that's, we already know, is leading to rent arrears. We're seeing uh, a heightened risk of homelessness for those people. And to put it into context, that, those 227 people that we have identified so far, there may actually be more, um, they need to find an additional £136,000 this year to cover that rent. Uh, and we have a mismatch with housing stock and housing needs. Uh, we know that 45% of people on the waiting list are single applicants, but only about 18% of the actual stock uh, is single bed properties. So the cliff edge is really asking to get that loophole closed quite urgently, um, because the longer the legislation is delayed, the more people potentially will fall into that trap. So that's, that's one thing that we want to see. Um, the other part really is actually on the private rented sector. Um, from my experience with, with NIFA and housing associations, we're actually quite fortunate that there's there's a fair bit of support that surrounds um, social housing tenants, but we don't have that same infrastructure around uh, the social rented sector. And it's a comparable sized um, sector, you know, there's about 140,000 there. But over the past decade, cuts to, to local housing alliance rates have really created an affordability issue. Um, housing rights research back a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, uh, find that almost nine out of ten private rental properties in Northern Ireland were out of reach for those uh, relying on housing benefit or, or universal credit to cover their rent costs. So this is a concern that we've had over recent years, and the loss of rented accommodation has consistently been in the top three reasons for for homelessness in Northern Ireland. So that inability to afford rent uh, can lead to homelessness. The COVID crisis interestingly shone quite a big light uh, on this issue for private renters uh, with almost three quarters of COVID-19 related calls to housing rights um, being received were from private renters, uh, which is a really, really high number of people who are, were gravely concerned about their, their rental situation. Uh, and I think it's timely, uh, particularly with the, the minister's statement last week that she does, or a couple of weeks ago, where she does want to look at um, the private rented sector. Um, we also have an ongoing issue with supply. Uh, there's a lack of affordable one and two bed houses or properties in most of Northern Ireland. Uh, and that's a concern given the predominance of single people and small families that are presenting as homeless. Um, and it's maybe worth reiterating that the cost of dealing with homelessness cases is high. It's, it's really high. Um, estimates from about 2015, I think, said it was about £15,500 or thereabouts. 
to deal with a homeless case. Um, so, you know, the more people who are struggling to, to keep their accommodation, the more risk there is and the more cost there is to the public purse in trying to deal with that. And then there's a, a sort of a final point to it, which is for those who do manage to, to keep the private rental homes, um, they are having to prioritize rent payments over as other essentials such as food and heating. There's a real poverty issue here that goes goes beyond just, just rent. Uh, and research carried out, I think it's by the Nevin Institute, uh, shows that there are more people um, at risk of poverty after housing costs in the private rented sector than the social rented sector. So there's a real problem there with people who are doing their very best to pay that rent and keep a roof over their heads, but having to make huge sacrifices in other areas. And particularly at this time of year, when you think about fuel poverty, which was touched on earlier on uh, in, in the, the briefing this morning, uh, there are big concerns there. So as, as a coalition, um, we're lucky that we have the social landlords have, have an element of uh, infrastructure around us, but we really think that there needs to be an infrastructure put around the private rented sector, perhaps a ring fenced fund, um, similar to what was set aside for the voluntary and charity sector when UC came in and the mitigations package started. It could be something like that. And then we need to look at local housing alliance rates. Um, uh, I think there, there's work there that needs to be done on the affordability of the private rented sector. Uh, and I'm not sure if, if Ursula can hear or can 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 speak at this point, but that's all I need to say on the housing matters, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Patrick, Ursa, can you hear us or can we hear you more to the point? <laughs> <laughs> no, we still can't hear you, Ursula, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on at all. So don't... Could you go out and then again? I think she did. She go did. out and then again. Oh, did she? Oh, yeah. right. For some reason, we're not picking up Ursula's sound, um, but we'll, we'll press on and we'll maybe see if you can go in and out again. We'll try it again, um, but we'll pr just press on because I know that we are, we are, we are tight for time as well here today. Um, I know that you have been listening in to our briefing for a little while now, so you have. So you would have heard about the, the letter that I mentioned that the department had sent, um, where it states that officials have been working on draft proposals for a review, a review of mitigations um, using the principle of co-design. So that's where I want to uh, uh, come in with you then. So I would imagine as part of that co-design, um, you have been involved with those to proposals with the department, if you can tell me what your involvement there has been on that review. Um, and you heard also then both Kelly, my vice, the vice chair and myself, mention that this is something that the committee brought up very early on. Um, this year about welfare mitigations and the need for that scrutiny by the committee. Um, and I think because we haven't had that scrutiny from the committee that um, the, the, the situation has got worse. Um, so it has and some of those issues that you've mentioned. And I think uh, also to mention then about what Patrick said about the private rented sector, we know that we are heavily reliant here in Northern Ireland on the private rented sector um, for our social homes, as well as affordable rents for people as well that are not maybe so affordable now. Um, but I think COVID has shone a another spotlight on the private rented sector of just how precarious that can be for people, um, especially those that have been that are that are facing hardship or losing their jobs. So if I could just um, maybe if you could just go into a bit of detail of what um, what conversations you've been having with the department mm -hmm. around the review. Paula, as far as I know, Patrick, you can come in on this. We've had no formal consultations with the department on the review thus far. Wow. Um, we uh, have a, a, a meeting with the minister next week. Okay. Um, but apart from that, we have really fed in our kind of recommendations for how a future mitigation package should look. But we have had no kind of... Um, We've had no kind of input on uh, the co-design process as yet. Um, as far as we were aware, it hasn't started. Okay. All right. Well, for that, I mean, I, I kind of find that worrying as well because we know the Cliff Edge Coalition is, um, their, their, your opinion is very valued. Um, so it is, we know how credible you are. Uh, we know the backgrounds that you come from, so I would like to think that there would have been some sort of conversations with the department on the way forward on that. Um, so that's a little bit disappointing. Um, and uh, so you've mentioned there, you mentioned the bedroom tax and you mentioned the child, child benefit cap and private housing. Are there anything further that you would be, you would be uh, considering as your asks 
um, for us certainly as a committee mm -hmm. um, whenever we do look at that review? Well, first of all, we would say that it's kind of split into two pieces. There's two urgent priorities, and that is to close those loopholes. And that can be done now within the current legislative framework, particularly the benefit cap, which needs secondary legislation. And as I said, we've got about a thousand families affected. We had four, over 46,000 people applied for universal credit in March. Many of those families are going to be coming to the end of that nine month grace period, and they are going to be falling foul of that benefit cap right now right now so honestly that legislation needs to come forward urgently the same applies to the bedroom tax loophole it does require primary legislation but again um, it was due to come forward um, in august and then of course the current mitigation package has been pushed forward to december but those loopholes are still very much in existence and while they continue to be open people are falling through the gap basically, and they're falling over that cliff edge. So, you know, we are effectively facing another cliff edge now in, at the end of December, unless we see that urgent legislation brought forward. Patrick, I don't know whether you want to come in on that at all. I think the, the point that I would make there is really is, is that we as the coalition would really like that um, reassurance that the committee will be able to scrutinize um you know as has been said by here already we really have had no formal engagement with with the department on the mitigations moving forward so we would like to see uh, you know a very definite bit in there that says that that your committee will scrutinize anything that's going forward and perhaps give us the opportunity to to feed into that as well if we don't get any more formal uh, engagement with the department I think in response to that, Patrick, I'd like to say that the committee would also like that certainty, um, that they can be part of, of the review and part of that scrutiny, because up to date we've had um, very little input um, either way, either from the department or from this committee. Um, and I know, I know their circumstances have led away with many other things that have been going on, um, but uh, it is something the committee uh, certainly feels that they, 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 they think it is more of a matter of urgency. Um, that we should be looking at that. Um, I was going to ask you something else, and you've just put me off my complete uh, train of thought there, so you have. So I'm just trying to quickly scroll back in my brain. No, it's gone. It will come back to me. So it will. Um, at the minute, I have Mark Durkin has his hand up for a question, and then Kelly. So I'm going to go to Mark then first. Mark, are you there? Yeah. Happy day. Yeah, hello. Ahead. I thought you were you were, you were trying to silence me as well. <laughs> Not you, Chair, of course, just Starley. And thank you, you Kira. Uh, Kira, Kira, and Patrick for that. And it's just on the the, the point that you were addressing there, Chair. You you'll know that I've made this point several times now that it's important that primary legislation uh, for a review of the mitigations that closes uh, these loopholes that we've been here about and about is laid before the assembly as soon as possible and that we avoid the need for accelerated passage but the cynic in me thinks that, that, that sort of that's where the department's going with this that they want they pop there they possibly uh don't want us trolling over and and, and, and scrutinizing that and 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 i think well, I might be paranoid, but it doesn't mean they're not out to get us because we have been raising this for quite some time. We haven't heard anything back. The coalition themselves, who have been uh, key critical friends, should I say, of the department throughout the whole welfare reform uh, process, have been kept very much in the dark too. So I would be proposing that we write to the minister yeah. and in a strongly written uh, letter uh, re requesting an update uh, from her on what exactly is happening here. I know many of us will have been putting in uh, written questions or asking oral questions on this as individuals or, or uh, along with party members, but we as a committee really need to start uh, sort of jumping up and down about this because it is something that we very much want to scrutinise. We need to make sure that this is right, that there aren't loopholes or cracks uh, that vulnerable people are, are, are falling through. And, and I don't think we should be denied uh, that right to, to get it right. And it's not about us. It's not us being precious. It's about trying to protect people. And the coalition obviously have a, a key role in that uh, too. Just in, in terms of questions, I know uh, the, the, the issue, Sarah, have been raised also around 
the benefit cap and there's also the two child uh, tax rule just was maybe for Kira more so what sort of impact are you finding that those measures are, are having on claimants here massive impacts now i'm talking from my own experience working as a volunteer in north belfast but through the covid19 pandemic it is really single parents who are facing so much hardship especially if they have more than two children because they are being impacted by both the benefit cap and the two child limit and when i when i say that they cannot afford the basics i truly mean that food gas and electricity are you know uh, requests that we see time and time again but um even more seriously than that they face a crisis if something that we might take for granted for example their washing machine breaking down or their cooker breaking down or a lot of parents went through a really tough time come september when they faced a huge cost for a uniform for a first year um or, or big life events you know it's just pushing families into not just poverty but literally destitution where they're not able to afford the very basics um, and uh, you know that's why we really welcomed when we heard news that the minister was looking at the two child limit in particular and um, but again we would encourage action on this because more and more people are suffering as time goes on and it looks like the way things are going it's only going to get worse no, well, well, I've asked several different questions in several different formats, <laughs> and they've got several different answers. So I think that's why it's important that we as a committee uh, s s seek that clarity ourselves. Uh, no, I don't care, just w w while you were speaking there, uh, I, I dug out an old tweet that had something in the back of my he head that I had seen from you before, and it was something that you'd, you'd said in September. You were citing a statistic with around 14,500 UC claimants are over 50. And that's a figure that we can sadly expect to rise, I'm sure, uh, when the, the furlough scheme ends uh, 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 as a result of the pandemic. But you said there's a real need for a tailored employment program for older workers. Is this something you would see being operated maybe through the universal credit system? Or do you think it would be better to keep it distinct and avoid any association, real or perceived, with additionality and, and the system of sanctions? I think that an employment program could be run very well by the Department for Communities within the auspices of um, you know, the local jobs and benefits offices, but it will require that work coaches, we know that there's thousands of work coaches being recruited and they're going to be steeped in this really complicated system um, you know, that has lots of different strands and entitlements and eligibility criteria. So it would need probably a specially trained team of work coaches to really give specialist support to those people that are losing their job who are over 50. So they are going to face being on universal credit um, you know, until they reach pension credit age. Um, many people from my own research around this, because I've been looking at uh, in-work conditionality, this new concept that's going to hit us very soon, whereby people will not just be expected to work part-time, they'll be expected to search for full-time hours and they'll face sanctions if they may face sanctions or additional conditionality measures if they can't evidence that they have been doing enough to search for more work or better work. And I've done a little bit of research around older workers in Northern Ireland and many work part time um, for reasons of care and responsibilities and um, because of health issues um, and simply because they've got to a point in their life where they feel that they want to work part time. And yes, this has become even more important as thousands of over 50s are becoming unemployed due to COVID-19. And the reality is that their employment prospects in a squeezed economic market where we have less jobs is going to be really, really narrow. And it's going to be so difficult for them to get back to the labor market. And they face these punitive measures under universal credit, you know, and we are going to see a rise in poverty over that age as well. It's going to be across the board, but that age group 
um, face very specific challenges in relation to being able to get back into the labour market in terms of skill shortage, in terms of education deficit, in terms of health impacts and caring responsibilities. Okay, no, no, thank you, Kieran. There's certainly a, a lot to be done there, uh, that, that's for sure. And now, this one isn't strictly on buffer reform, per se, or, or, or the mitigations, but, but you mentioned there around the universal contingency, universal credit contingency payment, and people's lack of awareness around that, and how that can then lock them out of a later uh, or access later on to a discretionary support. Uh, Grant, in terms of the discretionary support grant, I don't know where you follow in the Assembly earlier in the week. I, I, I'm sure you were. At now, the discretionary support grant now has another sticker on it that seems to have a, a COVID isolation a sticker on it. But I, I've argued that the income threshold for that, you know, for this use as a self-isolation grant, in effect, is simply too low. It's locking too many people, too many households out of being able to access it. Is that the sense that you guys would share and are there maybe any other changes that you think uh, could be made to it? Well, Mark, I can't speak for the coalition on this point because discretionary support isn't one of the the priorities that we're looking at in terms of um, the current the current um, mitigation package and what needs to be in terms of looking you had me <laughs> yes in my in my personal view um i think that the discretionary support system needs to be looked at as a whole i think that it is more restrictive than the social fund was it's harder to get access to the contingency fund has been um a stickler for me for years at this point because anybody who i have talked to have not heard of it, have not been made aware of it. Even the, the name, the contingency fund, a lot of claimants don't actually know what that means um, and how to get access to it. So um, I think that that is absolutely critical because at the moment we end up with an illogical ecosystem whereby, for example, the executive have allocated a total of £6.5 million in COVID emergency support for food parcels and community support. To me, that money would be better served in a discretionary support system that works really well, that gives people better access, um, that isn't as restrictive, whereby people are able to access immediate financial support and have the agency and dignity of spending that money how they need to. At the minute, it seems like it's restrictive and it's dehumanizing in terms of the questions that people are asked in order to prove that they are impoverished enough to deserve a discretionary support payment. Um, and as I say, because a lot of people have taken the universal credit advance payment, that's pushing their debt away up and they can't access um, support from discretionary support. But in terms of the isolation grant, my, my own opinion is that if you are in receipt of qualifying benefits, which show that you are on a low income. If you have a COVID positive test and you are unable to work for a period of 14 days, you should be able to access a self-isolation grant and it no, should be discretionary. Yeah, it shouldn't be, but it shouldn't be contingent on having a positive test either. You can have a, a contact with a positive. Yes, no. right. I would say if you are to self-isolate, for the period of two weeks, yeah. if it is determined that you have to stay in your home and you can't work, you know, you should be able to access that grant. It should not be a discretionary decision where a frontline decision maker looks at your situation and, you know, sees whether you're in enough hardship because the fact is that's going to be unfair. One decision maker might think that you should have access to it. Another decision maker might think that you shouldn't. And so it's just not going to have equality of access across the board during this time. Yeah, it's up to someone's discretion as to whether or not you qualify for it. And then it's up to them how much you qualify for as well. So no, that's fine, Keira. Th uh, thank you. And thanks, Patrick. And thanks, Ursula. Thanks, Mark. Can I just ask a couple of follow-up questions there? 
um, especially, well, first about around the advanced payment stuff. Um, okay. uh, back in February, members of this committee, and actually it was a full cross-party membership, mm -hmm. attended a roundtable with some um, service or some users of or some service users. I'm back to my health service days here. Of some, mainly women, they were um, around the table who were telling us their story and how this advanced payment started them off on the you back foot yeah. from the very beginning and caused them so much financial distress. And we brought that back to the committee um, at that time and, and to the minister and the minister at the time, Deidre Hargey and, and Carol as well, were very much okay. This needs to change. The information given out to people needs to change. We need to tell them that that is not that is not the option. The other, you know, they don't need to go for that option. There are other ways. Um, so, just to ask, have you noticed a difference even between sort of that period um, of the assembly being back up and running again to now on the the levels of advanced payments that are being handed out? Has that has that decreased? Are people um, being uh, made aware? Of, of the of the other fund and then secondly i just want to ask then another question around what mark was sent to do with the with people going back to work and you'd mentioned about the over 50s kelly and i attended a conference yesterday um uh, with i think the law center ran at the commission it was commission on social security um and they were they had mentioned about the the, the work side of, of the benefit system and how they felt that that should be separate. It shouldn't be within that whole benefit system. There is a conflict of interest there. Um, we do know that um, there is a lack of available suitable employment because what suits someone may not suit someone else. And we know that people, as you say, are, are receiving punitive measures um, uh, on many on many constraints, no fault of their own. Um, so it's just if you just to expand just a little bit on that, and then the, the other bit about UC, and uh, I've got Kelly then to speak after that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Paula. In terms of the advanced payments, um, you know, I, I've looked just last night at the data from DFC, and uh, civil servants briefed us to say that less people were taking the advanced payments, but. The reason was more so in the context of COVID-19 that many people who we call them, I suppose, new claimants due to COVID-19 um, were able to see through that five week period without the advance payment. However, there was still 50 percent, around 50 percent, and that's been consistent throughout. 50% of people will take that advance payment. Um, now, our colleague and member of the coalition working group, Siobhan Harding, recently published um, research from uh, the Women's Support Network that showed that uh, knowledge of the contingency fund continues to be very, very low. People simply do not know that they have the option of um, accessing a grant rather than a loan. But there's also evidence to show that uh, that grant that they get through the contingency fund isn't necessarily the equivalent of what they would receive um, in the advance payment, but it is still overall most likely a better option. Um, what I would say is, look, and the Cliff Edge Coalition have said this before, it's really fantastic that the mechanism of the contingency fund is there, that it was introduced through the um, first mitigation package. Um, and my kind of my kind of point of view would be, why isn't it being utilised? Why isn't it being used? Why isn't that fund being topped up? And for people to access rather than, as you say, being put on the back foot and starting their universal credit claim in a huge amount of debt, which is going to be deducted from future UC payments, which is going to leave them more in need um, and unable to access emergency support through discretionary support as well. Um, so I do think that that's a really positive instrument um, that we have there. And um, I think it would be great to see it become more accessible. Yeah, just on that, just to come back on that point, I, I'm very disappointed. I'm sure other members will agree with me because this was something that was highlighted very early on this year. Um, that yes, people may not know about the con the contingency fund, 
um, but the department know about it. Yep. So why are people not being signposted and told you can apply for a contingency fund and maybe a smaller amount of advance payment? I mean, it's it, completely no-brainer to me why that is not being done. I think as a committee, um, along with what Mark had proposed earlier, I think we will be writing again to the minister and, the two, and to the department around that. But that needs to be pushed. That needs to be pressed. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad you were able to tell us that, and it is disappointing. And then just a bit on the work side of it, about splitting those funds. Uh, what I just would also say about the contingency fund that I have to say the department do have it on the journal on the universal credit journal it is there but it is maybe not as visible as it could be for people to actually see it and access it um, and again it's just thinking of that word contingency fund a lot of people don't maybe realize what that means um, and are thrown off by that so i think there's very simple ways um, that it could be made more accessible um, in terms of the work point um, yes i think it would be useful to have um, you know the employment support as a separate function outside of conditionality and sanctions because it is very very hard for a work coach to play those two roles and historically that hasn't been the case now we're seeing where a work coach has to be a friend and a foe because they are faced with this situation where they have to give employment support but at the same time if they feel somebody isn't hitting the mark on what they're supposed to do, they then have to maybe implement a sanction or um, another kind of punitive measure to, um, well, encourage that person to do more around their work, work seeking activity. And that can have a really detrimental impact on the relationship between the individual that is seeking work and um, the work coach. So I definitely think that there is benefits to that being um, outside uh, the infrastructure of the Jobs and Benefits Office. But what I obviously would caution about, what I would caution is that that is still not, um, say, contracted out to a, an employment company because we've seen a lot of issues um, around that, uh, Paula, as well. And, and it would be better to be remain under the auspices of DFC more widely, but it might be interesting um, to pilot having it as a separate service, particularly for those who are over 50. Again, I would say that this is me talking as Kira, and these, you know, these aren't kind of um, issues that the coalition have looked at in our group. So, um, yeah, I just want to kind of give a disclaimer <laughs> to that effect. No, that's that's fine, Kira, and you've just given us some uh, food for thought. And you know, I, 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 I think it is something that could be doable. That last point there. Um, uh, with it being kept within uh, the department um, and Northern Ireland could maybe lead the way on that. That would be something that would be really good for us. Um, but you've given us lots of food for thought there and I'm sorry I, I took you way out of where you were supposed to be there. Apologies. So I'm going to go back on track here again. And the only person I have left that wants to ask a question is Kelly. Thank you very much, Kira, um, Patrick and Ursula. I know, Ursula, you're having trouble with your, your sign there today, but um, very much appreciate that you're here with us. But... Um, Guys, I'll try Kira and Patrick. I have questions for both of you. Patrick, I'll maybe start off with you to give Kira a bit of a breath at this stage. Um, Patrick, as Kira has said there, there have been a lot of people who have entered universal credit this year. Um, and when they enter universal credit, as we know, the five-week assessment period means that there's a break in, in particular, their rent um, and payment of their rent. So I'm just wondering, from, from the housing point of view, how many people now have gone into arrears? Um, and are we looking at potential difficulties coming forward because of the number of people who are losing jobs, going on to universal credit, getting that gap in income? Um, and and what, are, what are we faced with now? I'll be honest, I don't have any up-to-date figures on what those arrears levels are like. Because for quite a long time, it was hard to decouple um, the five-week wait bit because for a long time, the systems didn't allow us to see when somebody had moved on to universal credit. That has now changed. There have been improvements in the, uh, the landlord portal so we can see quite quickly when somebody's coming on board. But I don't have a figure. But there will definitely be arrears there. Um, and it's whether people can catch up on those that would be our biggest concern because that's a long wait uh, without housing costs getting covered. 
Um, so it's perhaps something that we as a sector need to go out and uh, investigate more on. There's also a concern for me with regards to people who are going under statutory sick pay. And when they're going under statutory sick pay, they're immediately finding that their income level has dropped considerably. Um, they're also, because they're employed, um, they're, they're normally above the income, you know, the, the maximum income floor level to get access to the discretionary support self-isolation grant. Um, mm -hmm. So what we're finding then is people, anecdotal evidence, because I've asked, um, is there any evidence, you know, out there of, of how many people this is, but it's, it's proving impossible to find. But um, there's so many an anecdotal evidence of people gone on to statutory sick pay. They haven't realised because they've never had to take it before. Um, they're, they're jumping down from maybe a few hundred pounds per week down to 90, whatever it is, 95 pound a week on statutory sick pay and paying rent, paying mortgages is becoming completely impossible. And the worst thing that's happening is that they're going on to statutory sick pay because they're being pinged. They have no um, symptoms themselves. So a lot of people are now starting to delete the app and presenteeism is becoming a problem um, where people are staying at work because they can't afford to take the statutory sick pay. But I'm just worried that the statutory sick pay people, they're going off work more regularly and that's going to cause impacts again for the arrears with housing. So if you have any future information on that, I would really appreciate if you could share that with us in the committee because it is something we, we need to keep an eye on. Um, Kira, one of the things that I have done is I've asked if there's any possibility as part of our welfare mitigations packages, if we could consider statutory sick pay, um, even if Northern Ireland had a slight increase to offer there so that we don't have that presenteeism, because of course that's going to share the virus out. But um, one of the things when I was working on that is this discretionary support self-isolation. The income floor level is at 20,400. Have you guys any thoughts on that being increased? I know that the minister is considering this at the moment, but is there a level that you would prefer that to go to that we can maybe ask the minister about? To be honest, Kelly, that's not something that we have considered. Um, the you know the income floor around uh, the discretionary support isolation grant. But as I said to Mark, we are in extraordinary times. You have pointed out. Um, we have people potentially deleting the app, going to work because they can't afford not to. And that is having the negative implications of spreading the virus um, and keeping the infection rate high. So I think that one of the solutions overall is definitely to improve the actual access to that system. So while it was so positive to see that the scheme has been extended, and to see that the levels of support have, have been risen. Um, it's, it's actually the accessibility. So if there was an opportunity to raise the income floor at all, I would only see that as a positive thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just to go back to what you were talking about, about the benefit cap look, loophole and the bedroom tax. To be honest, I think we do have a minister and we have a department who would recognise, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming to the end at the end of December. So I could see an extension being made, um, you know, through to the end of March until the new measures come forward. And as the chair has said, if only the committee could have access to um, some of the information, that would be fantastic. But I'm just thinking, are there any other avenues other than those loopholes that we should be considering? Is, is or are all of the welfare mitigations working? Are they not, what, what's not working? Um, is there anything that we're missing on? Is there anything that all of a sudden has come forward now? So we know about the benefit cap, it's awful. And to be honest, thank you for raising the grace period um, because that terrifies the life out of me. In the mouth of Christmas, we're gonna have families having a massive reduction in their benefits, um, which is terrifying. So we will ask the minister about that. But it's the bedroom tax, of course, is something that Northern Ireland, we don't have alternative houses to send people to. So the bedroom tax is something we need to continue. But if there's anything else that you can bring forward for us, um, I know that, that the chair had mentioned the UC, UC Us thing that we went to earlier mm -hmm. in the year, and it was invaluable to have that um, direct voices coming to us. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's anything else there, the bit about the, the um, contingency fund, agon I, I, I'm furious about it, to be honest, because it is it should be the one thing that's offered first. And I know in the past we were given an explanation by officers to say it was a fixed budget and they didn't want to run out. Well, they're not spending it, so 
let's spend it, please. There are people, people in difficulty now. But if you guys have anything at all um, outside of the loopholes that you've mentioned today that we should be considering as a committee to push the department and the minister to think about or to add, um, we, we need that because um, it's people on the ground that know where the problems are. Mm -hmm. Kelly, um, two things. We are very worried that the, the current mitigation package might be extended again to March. That is a concern for us um, because that simply means that unless these loopholes are closed urgently, we are going to see more and more people impacted by the bedroom tax and the benefit cap. So what we're really trying to stress today is that those priorities, those two loop loopholes are critical and they need urgent action. They really, really do. Um, in terms of the future priorities, we have outlined three main future priorities, and that is the five-week wait for universal credit, the two-child limit, which is, as I said in the presentation, is going to have a disproportionate impact on families in Northern Ireland, where we have naturally bigger families. Families are losing out on £2,780 per year because of the two-child limit. The people who are suffering here are the children because they didn't have the choice whether to be born as a third child and they are being penalised in these current circumstances, whereas committee members have outlined the labour market is squeezed beyond belief. So for no fault of their own, they are being punished. So the two child limit is another one. And then the third priority, which Patrick outlined in his presentation, is more um, intensive support for private renters who have suffered so much due to um, the cuts in Social Security over the last 20 years, um, particularly around uh, the local housing allowance. Um, I was speaking to an advisor colleague just a few, uh, few days ago, and they said that that is a major issue that they're seeing at the moment. Basically, that the LHA isn't stretching uh, to the rent that is required, um, and people are living in conditions that belong in another time. Um, and it is just having a real detrimental impact on all aspects of their life. Um, and that is something that the Cliff Edge Coalition have explained before. Um, in the last presentation to yourselves, um, colleague Andy McLennigan from Bagwell said that this cost of poverty is being displaced into other public services. So we heard Julianne Maney on The View a couple of weeks ago. We are seeing the huge health implications of poverty and hunger on children and on adults alike. Um, and it's also very interesting. We don't have enough evidence yet, but we're also seeing the impacts of COVID um, hit those areas of economic disadvantage more intensely. So there really does need to be social security measures put in place now. I know. I, I, I've had evidence in this last week of um, nurseries that provide, you know, PEGS places, the statutory, you know, um, preschool places for children closing down. How could they close whenever they're being funded? But they're be they are closing. And then, as, as you had mentioned earlier, the over 50s, now that I'm on the, in that age bracket, but... Um, it's, it's one of those things that the apprenticeships are geared towards the 16 to 24 year olds, which they very need to be, but we also need um, something geared at those over 50s um, to ensure that end of life employment, we don't have jobs for the full life anymore. So end of life employment is also available and, and ready. And if we have the amount of house building, Patrick, that we're hoping that's coming forward, we should have lots of people out there who have amazing skills, who can actually maybe even be the pr apprentice trainers for those young people. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, I'm sure we will be pushing the, the uh, minister and the department to get that review information as quickly as possible. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you. No other member has um, indicated that they want to speak. Can I just then finish off? Um, Mark had put a proposal forward earlier on um, uh, that we write to the minister as a matter of urgency around the, the loopholes. Um, and we as a committee will certainly do that. Um, I just uh, want to just uh, remind, remind members, I'd read it out earlier, and just to let you know again, that in our letter we received from the department yesterday, it said the department will look to agree a further extension 
to the present or, or to these arrangements, meaning the present arrangements, yeah. until the 31st of March 21, if necessary. Um, so that appears to be where we are. That's the state of play at the moment. So it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. So certainly we'll be doing that. And then also the contingency fund that I want to definitely as a committee to write back to the minister again because I know she feels strongly about this. Yes. Um, that this actually should be made as as a, a a first option. Maybe need to change the name of it um, because advance payment and contingency fund. I know which one I would log on to yeah. first. Um, one that mentions actually payment of money. Um, so yeah, that's something else that we will do. And I just want to um, and I know we're really pushed for time here too, but I just want to just say. Um, uh, Kelly brought up about the apprenticeships. It's something I have brought up many times and how that dispor disproportionately affects women. It affects all of those women um, that have uh, have uh, brought up their children or whatever else they may have done and decide that they want to go and do something different in life and they're because of, of age, it disproportionately affects them. It affected my son when he left the army because he was told at 28, you're too old to retrain in something else. So there's a vast array of people that this the, the apprenticeships is affecting um, and I know certainly I've had those conversations with with uh, Diane um, uh, to, to look at br trying to bring in something more best book for for older um, for older people um, I think that I know Andy had his hand up there only if you are major major yeah, quick I will be I'll be concise chair just just the point and, and the minister did raise it in the chamber around the self-isolation grant and, and the point around the contingency fund where she said that the information isn't getting out there to people that that is um, a non-repayable grant so there's evidence uh, that this is happening across the board so yeah. just just to reiterate that that point and the other thing um, if, if members are agreeable is just to get uh, up-to-date information on underspends across the, the medications as well as possible. Yeah. yeah, no, and that's that's a point that we, we sometimes overlook and we should certainly uh, be asking for those details as well. Look, folks, can I thank you? Um, thank you, Arshla. Sorry we could not hear your voice today, <laughs> but we, we will certainly have that amended for the next time. And Kira and Patrick, um, really good, as per usual, great, bene or great uh, evidence session that have left us with more questions than answers, but that's good, that's how it should be. Yeah. And thank you for attending today. Okay? Thank you. Very thank much. you now. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, members, we're going to move then. So, uh, but all of that was agreed then. That's our agreed actions. Was there any other actions, any other member that members wanted to bring up? Or are we agreed on those actions? Agreed. All agreed? Okay. Okay. So yeah. we can move on the agenda item seven. Um, okay, that is then a briefing by Drumbo Park representative on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, you'll find papers for this item at page 29 and further papers arrive which are also in your tabled packs. Um, members should note that as well as the Drumbo Park paper, they have been provided with a departmental response in respect of the impact of abolishing the surrender principle at page 32. If members wish to receive a full copy, which I think Kelly did, um, it's many, many, many pages long, um, please contact uh, is it the bit, bleh, committee office and uh, they'll direct you in the, where you need to go to find all of that. So can I then um, open up the meeting then and uh, welcome John Connor. Who is Operations Director Director at Drumbo Park. John, you are very, very welcome to our meeting today. I know you've been there for some time waiting. So can I just um, pass over to yourself, John, if there's anything that you want to, to say before members want to ask some questions? Yep. Um, thanks very much, uh, guys, for giving us the opportunity to brief the committee. Um, it's a vitally important issue. Um, and, and for both ourselves uh, at Drumbo Park and indeed the wider greyhound industry. Um, as uh, you've mentioned there, I'm the operations director at Drumbo Park and I'm actually part of the staff team that took over the stadium um, following the liquidation of the former company last year. Um, we directly employ around 45 people, but uh, we estimate that there's around 500 people um, either directly or indirectly directly linked to the greyhound industry and are basically reliant on ourselves at Drumbo Park remaining open. Uh, hopefully you have a copy of our submissions um, from the end of October there and the 16th of November. Um, as I'm sure you can all appreciate that the COVID pandemic um, has, has it's been a very challenging time for us here at Drumbo Park um, as it has the rest of the hospitality industry. And uh, I think it's highlighted the important role that the, uh, that the industry plays in um, just wider society here in Northern Ireland. Um, looking forward, it's with, we believe it's essential for the hospitality industry, um, has a legislative framework that allows us 
to um, flourish and help grow both the tourism and the hospitality industries and employ as many people as possible. Um, ourselves at Drumbo Park, we're very, um, we're very proud of the fact that we employ an awful lot of young people. For many, it's actually their first job on, on the employment ladder, and um, it, it's something that we're, we're hoping to grow in the, in the coming years. Um, sensible licensing rules are essential um, for, the, for the future of the industry, and we welcome the Assembly's plans to modernise the current licensing regime, including a plan to allow us to flexibly open on Sundays, um, for which we already actually have plan consent. Um, Drumbo Park at the minute, we, we have a place of public entertainment licence, and it really only allows us uh, to sell alcohol on Friday and Saturday nights until 11pm, um, even though we actually have an entertainment licence from Lisburn and Castlereagh Council that uh, allows us uh, to 1am. 1, 1 oh, unfortunately, the way things are at, at present, that puts us at a huge competitive disadvantage with the many bars, restaurants and other venues in the greater Belfast area that we're trying to um, compete for custom with. Um, and we feel the, the way things are going with the bill, that this competitive advantage will, will um, disadvantage will actually get worse if those uh, establishments are allowed to open until 2am as proposed. Um, we ourselves, we're, we're actually not looking to, to remain open to 2am, um, but we're asking that we're allowed the flexibility to open to 1am on Fridays and Saturdays so that we can compete, so that we can compete on as basically as, as fair a level as we can. Um, and without the flexibility that that would give us, we actually fear for the future of the stadium itself and indeed the, the wider greyhound industry. Um, so allowing us to open up until 1am would be consistent with our entertainment licence that we currently have from the council. Um, and we, know, we note that the bill is actually proposing to equalise alcohol licences and entertainment licences, so it would help our case in that regard. Um, in, order us, in order for us to open on the Friday and Saturday nights until 1am, we propose that places of public entertainment and outdoor stadiums like ourselves are included within Article uh, 45 of the licensing order. Um, a present Article 45 allows certain licensed premises to open to 1am 20 times a year with the consent um, of local PSNI. Um, that obviously, that consent mechanism allows the police you know, to protect sort of the local area for local residents and stuff like that. Um, the proposal to increase this to 85 times a year, uh, 85 times per year, but it would seem sensible for it to be 104 times a year. That would allow us to cover for the Friday and Saturday nights trading. Um, so increasing the number of nights to 104 and including places of public entertainment um, and outdoor stadiums within Article 45 would allow us um, to stay open and trade to 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights and compete fairly. Um, and basically, that's the crux of our, of, of our argument in relation to the amendment. OK. Is that you finished there, John, with that part? Yes? Yep. Okay. Yep, that is indeed. Yep. Um, John, you're very, very welcome. I have sat in, on the, the previous committee, so uh, the, whenever we had um, the previous owners of, of Drumbo in, and I remember at the time how grossly unfair it was on Drumbo uh, on, with that, the, the, the licensing laws. Um, and, you know, I think if it had been the committee's will, and the will of many, it would have been changed. A lot of this would have been changed to, to certainly support Drumbo. I have been to it, albeit it's been a little while since I've been there, um, but I have been there. I know exactly where you are. I know that you're not in the middle of a high street or a town centre, so there's not, not uh, you know, those anti-social behaviour issues. I know that everything can be under one roof. I like the idea that you can go there for dinner, you can go there for entertainment. It's all under one roof. Um, so, I mean, it has lots and lots of plus points. Um, so I absolutely get where you're coming from, um, where you where you say that um, the, the whole issue around entertainments and being given a fair footing, you know, and a fair chance to promote what you have there. Um, I think you said it in your, your, your submission. It, it, is Drumbo now the only um, then uh, racetrack that we have, the dog racetrack that we have here in Northern Ireland now? Um, I think there there's ourselves in the Brandywell, but okay. um, the Brandywell went under recent redevelopment there by the uh, Darien Straban City Council. But the facilities up there, it, it, it's basically only a, a track for racing, so that there's no amenities with regards to a stadium 
or food and beverage offering or anything like that there. So really we're the hub, we're the premier venue in, in, in Northern Ireland. So and it, really it, the whole yeah. industry sort of centers around ourselves. And there is a big following, and you know I think that that can't go unnoticed either. There is, a, you know, it, it, there is a big following here with our, in Northern Ireland um, for for this sport as well, and um, so I think that we have to do whatever we can um, to help uh, sustain that business that you have there and watch and, and to help it grow as well. Um, so I certainly will be in any way I can um, to try and see if we can fit your proposals, um, if we can we can bring those. Uh, forward to the department to see how that the, your proposals can fit in um, with with the bill. Um, I'm going to ask members if they have any other comments or questions. Kelly, I know you'll have something. Um, <laughs> As always, I, I was just going to ask John. Um, anybody else across Northern Ireland in the same position as yourselves? Does this affect? Well, Down Royal's just got or getting a stadium license. Um, who else does this affect other than yourselves? Um. <sighs> I'm, I'm unaware directly who it affects. Um, I suppose it really only came um, really evident to me having taken over the built or, or the uh, the business or a year a year or so ago. I know the issues and the problems that the previous owners kept sort of uh, trying to explain to me, but I, I was sort of more to do with the greyhound side of it. But now that I'm um, part owner of the business, I have a more holistic view of how it operates, and really, you, you know. Sitting in when you're listening to the Bookins team, um, when Bookins are coming in and having to explain to people that are coming for a night out, you know, that 11 o'clock, you know, your, your evening's over and you're having to go out and, and home, it's just putting us at a massive disadvantage. They might have customers that, you know, it's hard enough to get Bookins and they might have customers that we lose as a result of having to tell them that your night's cut short is, <coughs> is, main, is, is the main reason why we're coming here and asking for, for the amendment to you know, to be looked at. So your your licence, what is your current category of licence then? Our current category of licence is a, um, a place of public entertainment. So that's, there's bound to be others. Um, so on that five, one... Five one H, sorry, I think is the, the actual licence that we, we have. Okay. I uh, know, because I was trying to find out all of the different licences there are and my eyes started to cross. Um, so it's a place of public... Um, all right. Okay. Entertainment. Um, because to be to be honest, if it's aligned with your entertainment's license, which runs on to one, but you have to close the bar at eleven. Um, yeah. yeah. It's the flip side of what's actually said in the legislation. Then, where they're saying that the the bar license goes, or you know, the entertainment stops with the bar license. Um, your license is at eleven, but your entertainment goes yeah. on to one. Yeah. So okay then. Uh, to be honest, even even with regards to new, you know, posterous. Um, if we're putting a little bit of music on, currently we have to stop at 11. So, yeah. you know, essentially for us in the real world, we're, we're living with what the COVID restrictions are just on a permanent basis. It just seems just seems grossly unfair. Yeah, I, I like the, the chair, I have actually been to your place probably more times than I would like to admit. But um, yeah, um, there's quite a few friends of mine who have had a number of birthday parties there. Um, it is a family friendly atmosphere. Um, and to be honest, it... it it sort of counters what we're trying to do to balance out the licensing um, requirements to be fair across the whole industry. So, to be honest, I would be in support of you guys having the same um, options as Article 45 you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You've, yeah. That's yeah. Me. yeah. Okay. No, and I just want to say because at the time that I was there, and you are really put at a disadvantage. Uh, ours was a Christmas work night out. Um, so the way you are at the minute, you can only hold those at, at weekends and no other time that you can you can have um, that type of type of function. So it, yeah, it, um, it certainly is a real disadvantage. Um, so I think it is something that we do need to explore much further. Robin, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just a simple question. Uh, uh, Robin, have you been there? <coughs> um, no, chair. <laughs> I have to confess, I haven't been there and. To be honest, I would have no intentions of being there, and I just wanted to clarify with Mr. Connor. Uh, it's nothing to do with uh, my particular feelings on the matter, but could I just confirm if you were speaking uh, on behalf of the greyhound industry or only on behalf of Drumbo Park? Um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of of the entire industry in Northern Ireland. The, the industry 
here in the north is not funded in the same way that it is in GB or in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Republic of Ireland, they receive government backing to the tune of, I think it's this year, 19.2 million euro. Um, in the UK, they have the benefit of the uh, bookmaker levy, which helps support that uh, uh, industry over there. So we're sort of stuck in the middle. Um, and really, it, it, it's the commercial operations of the stadium that's helping maintain the industry here in Northern Ireland. So it, the, st the stadium needs to thrive. The stadium needs everything that, that, that can be made possible to help sort of grow the industry here and, and keep the guys, the local guys, you know, there's 450 active owners at the, uh, currently um, in Northern Ireland. And, and if Trumbo Park isn't allowed to compete in the level playing field with the likes of Dundalk Stadium, the likes of Shelburne Park in uh, Dublin, you know, th those guys are going to be forced to travel very long distances or the other option is just simply leave the industry. So I think it, it, it's it's imperative that, that Drumbo Park doing well will help um, local owners and trainers and people that, that um, derive a livelihood actually from, from Greyhound Racing to, um, to prosper. And is there a Greyhound Racing body, representative body or association of some sort? We are ruled and regulated by the Irish Coursing Club, so we run under the, the, the rules of those guys that are based in Clonmel, County Tipperary. Um, that's a historical thing coming from the 1958 Greyhound Act. Um, we, we run aligned all our rules and regulations in relation to welfare, um, all our racing protocols, we, we, close, we align them um, with those of the Irish Greyhound Board. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, Mark, Mark Durkin, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hello, go ahead. Thank, yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, John. Uh, uh, I won't be too long, Chair, but like yourself, I was on DSD committee a number of years back when, when, when this issue was brought to our attention before. Are, are they anomalies or irregularities or inconsistencies supposed to have existed around the situation at Drumble Park? I was uh, sympathetic to the situation then, and I, I remain uh, sympathetic now. So ju ju just to, to let John know that, and I think it's something we, we should certainly be considering going forward. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, nobody else has um, indicated that they want to ask any questions of any further questions to John. No, okay. John, thank you, and thank you for your, your, your paper evidence as well. Um, it certainly will go towards our um, evidence gathering. Um, for the, the licensing and registration of clubs bill um, and I think you've heard today that there is support there is support for, for certainly for yourself uh, and, and what you represent there and um, it, it, you know I, I think we just need to highlight again that there needs to be a fair fitting for everyone and it certainly hasn't been for yourselves so thanks a lot John for um, uh, being here rather early and having to sit in and listen to everything else that the committee was doing and for giving your briefing today Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, members. Okay, so that again is good. That gives us some more evidence towards our build. Um, so, can then, are we ready to move on then? Where am I? Because I have flicked pages over here. At eight, are we on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, start there. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, members. Um, can you ask you then to turn to the draft forward work programme? which is at page 33 of your meeting pack. Um, members, um, to accommodate as many briefings as is possible, it is proposed that meetings should start at 9 a.m. each week after Christmas recess, which would ensure that four briefing sessions could take place at each meeting. Okay. And I know that um, we are supposed to have fa be family friendly in the assembly and all of that, and people do have school runs to do, and I absolutely get that. Um, but we really don't have a lot of choice other than to start at 9 a.m. Um, it, yeah, it could be earlier if we, we get in after Christmas and find we've got lots more people we need to hear ev evidence from. But um, can I just ask any comments or queries on that? Are you, can you agree um, with, the, 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 uh, agree with the Forward Work Programme? Mm -hmm. Any comments, questions? All okay is, with that? Is it likely to grow, Chair? Sorry? The, the, the Forward Work Programme on the licensing is likely to grow in number. Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah, uh, yeah Rob. Uh, I don't, uh, one of these questions, do we know how many are likely to 
Uh, sorry, I, I know that's a, that's a crystal ball a question. Crystal ball. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, we could see it grow. It. I mean, there has been a, a lot of of document, uh, uh, you know, commentary around this, and um, I know certainly with any of our meetings where we're discussing it, um, Twitter it goes mad over it. Yeah. it. I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot of interest in this, so I'd imagine it will grow significantly. Yeah. So, are members okay with that? Then we'll start that after Christmas. Yeah. Our 9 a.m. Uh, start. Happy enough, Chair, with a nine o'clock start, because that'll get me out of being the school run. <laughs> Sinead, what about you? I know you have wins as well, so you're all right with it also? Yeah, no, just to say, look, it's there is school runs or whatever, but this has to be done, so just have to find some way to work around it, and I'm going to use that excuse, Mark's, Mark's <laughs> one right there as well. Okay. No, that's great. Look, thank you. Thank you I very much. I was just going to ask, Chair, as far as possible, um, in advance of, of the... the Lots of people who are going to come in to see us. Are they being asked to provide written um, information in advance as well? Because that would be good to prep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be the stage where uh, written, written evidence is certainly helps us. It yeah. really does. It yeah. means that we're able to have a good read over it. And it will maybe get to the stage where we don't actually ask them to present because we're tight for time. We just, because we've already received a briefing, we just go straight into questions. Yeah. Um, you know, so that might happen as well. But, you know, it, it's us as a committee that will... You know, decide what way forward we want to go with that. Okay. So yeah, most definitely, I think we should have a written briefing. Yeah. All right. Okay. To move on, then we'll just move then to agenda item eight, members, which is the draft committee report on the pension scheme bill. Members, you'll find this at page thirty-eight of your meeting pack. Can I ask if members any comment? Are they content to agree the report and order it to be printed? Print. All right. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, then moving on to uh, items 9 to 11. These are uh, uh, subordinate legislative SL1s. Yeah. So they're routine annual statutory rules relating to pensions. Yeah. These are annual orders which are made each year by the UK government to adjust, to adjust re evaluation rates in relation to pensions. Um, the department has no powers to do anything different, and the purpose of these rules is to protect individuals' pension savings. So I'll move then to agenda item nine, which is SL1, the State Pension Debits and Credits Reevaluation Number no. 2, Order Northern Ireland 2020. A copy of the SL1 is at page 56, or sorry, page 65. The Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 introduced a new state pension for people reaching state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2016. This proposed rule revalues new rate scheme pension debits and credits to reflect price increases um, since the debit and credit was created. So can I ask members, are they content that this rule be made? Agreed. All agreed? Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Then item number 10, SL1, the State Pension Re-Evaluation for Transitional Pensions, number 2, Order Northern Ireland 2020. Copy again of this L SL1 is at page 70 of your pack. The Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 introduced new state pension for people reaching state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2016. The proposed rule revalues protected payments to reflect increases in general level of prices since the 6th of April 2016. Okay, members, again, are you content that this rule be made? Content. All content, mm -hmm. yes. Great, yeah. thank you. Then, agenda item 11, SL1, the Occupational Pensions Re-Evaluation Order 2020. Again, you'll find this SL1 at page 75. Um, the proposed rule will specify the percentage by which preserved pension rights are revalued for members of salary-related occupational pension schemes who leave their scheme before pension age. A rule has to be made each year um, to apply to those who attain their scheme's normal pension age in the following calendar year. Um, all clear as mud there, members. Can I ask if you're agreed and content that this rule be made? Agreed. agreed. All agreed? Thank you. All right, I'm moving on then to agenda <coughs> item 12, which is SR 2020-245, the Personal Independence Payment Amendment Regulations yeah. Northern Ireland 2020. You'll find this at page 80 of your pack. Can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No objections? No. no. Nope. And I put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-245, the Personal Independence Payment Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules uh, report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, then moving swiftly along, then we'll go to agenda item 13, which is correspondence. Uh, members' correspondence memo is at page 88 of your meeting pack. I have nothing at this stage that I need to highlight. 
Members, uh, Kelly, you have... Yeah, I just wanted to ask, that High Street tax Task Force, um, one thing that it doesn't mention that the task force is going to do is give an update to this committee. Um, if we could maybe write and ask that the, the department ensures that there's a regular update from that, that grouping um, to hear. We are going to get a briefing, isn't it, from um, research? We have requested a commission to research paper from the research uh, service yeah. here, and that will be coming to us before Christmas in the pack. But um, certainly we can write as yes, well. Just, it, it, it just seems to be that they've left the committee out of that mm -hmm. group, um, just if we can get a regular update when they meet, whenever that might be. Nope, that's yeah. fair enough. Kelly, thank you for that. Any members? Uh, Mark or Sinead, have you anything you want to bring up under correspondence? No, no that's fine. Dead on. Okay. So then, members, can we agree the correspondence memo as set out in our pack? Yep. Agreed? Agreed. Good stuff. Agreed. Okay, agenda item 14, forward work programme. Um, can I just remind members that our first informal stakeholder briefing event on housing matters will be held next week, Tuesday the 24th of November from 1pm to 3pm in room 30. And also members um, at the meeting uh, next week, the 26th of November, we will be briefed by Assembly Research on the Licensing and Registration of Clubs Amendment Bill. The Department on the Financial Wellbeing Strategy and CO3 on the impact of COVID-19 on the charity sector. Any comments on Forward Work Programme? No, we're happy enough. Okay. Then we'll move on to Agenda Item 15, which is any other business. Can I just then ask <laughs> members any other business they want to bring up? No other business? Good stuff. Okay. Just, just, just one thing, Chair. Okay. Uh, and it's an issue that uh, had been brought to my attention by a few constituents uh, this week. Uh, recipients of PIP who had got a letter maybe a month ago or a few weeks ago telling them that their award had been extended to October 2021. Then this week uh, got a letter telling them, or, or with a form telling them they had to have it filled out and completed and returned uh, by the end of November. Now, uh, I'd put in a priority or a two-day priority question to the Minister on Monday. I have, haven't got a, an answer back yet, but I was just wondering, had any other members come across anything like this? And is there something maybe we as a committee could be asking for clarity on? Okay. It's caused an awful, awful lot of anxiety to people. They, they were told <laughs> uh, you, you're going to be getting this for a year, talking people here with mental health problems. That, that those are the ones I was talking uh, to now. And, uh, you know, it's bad enough at the best of times, but particularly in the context of the pandemic and when they had been given that assurance and now it's just been uh, pulled from under their feet. OK, Mark, Alex, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I, I've had a couple of those. Yeah, you've, you're, you're been aware of that. Other members are, are saying no, they haven't, but yeah. other, some are. So, Mark, if you could let the keep the committee yeah. members updated on... on um, Hmm. Any information that you receive, that would be great. Okay, well, uh, uh, well if I, I get an answer, well, and then yeah. I'm sure we can do something as a committee on it, yeah, maybe. absolutely. Sorry, well, Robin, go ahead. I was going to say, Mark, uh, if we could support Mark oh, at this stage, Mark, yeah. uh, and indeed ask the chair to, to write the same uh, question or similar question as you've already lodged. Okay. No, I'm happy enough, Mark, to support that. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to just inform members, just quickly, um, uh, I, I put it out over my social media, but certainly I was contacted by a lady yesterday who came into my office. I was speaking to her, um, who had received a letter about her winter fuel payment with the, the wrong bank details on it. Um, so after a lot of investigation by my office, who were, I have to say, rang various numbers, I finally got a, an email address I was able to write to. And the department phoned me back within 10 minutes of receiving my email um, to tell me that there had been a mistake, a big mistake, a big error had occurred. Um, uh, this awesome. year, this year it was DWP were, were sending out the letters and they'd got people's account numbers wrong. So they've assured me that this was rectified by the end of last week. Um, and you're not just talking a few people, you're talking um, a few thousand, I've been told. So it's just members, anybody comes into your office, with that query, um, they're not going to receive another letter with their with telling them that this has been rectified, but they've assured the, depart the uh, our own department 
have assured me that it has been this has been sorted out and people will get their winter fuel payment into their bank accounts. Well, All right. You, you, you've been told different from what I've been told. I've been told they will get another letter. No, well, I've been told they will get another letter because of the finance involved with sending out another letter. But if they do get all the better, if they don't, can you, everybody just as members, get that message out as well? So that's all I have to say. Mark, your hand's still up. Do you want to come back in? No? No, you can't hear me. All right, okay, members, I'm going to move on then. The item number 16, which is date, time and location of our next meeting, and just advise members that our next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 26th of November, at a much more respectable time of 10 a.m. here in room 29. And uh, just remind members that we now have a closed session briefing about to start um, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. Okay, thank you. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 29. This 